You are now listening to Sound Space, the podcast where we interview experts and professionals in the space of sound. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Sound Space. I am once again joined by my fantastic co-host, Anthony Catchy. How are you, Anthony? I'm doing very good, man. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. We have a doozy of a guest yes. for you today. Really excited about this. Yeah, very, very excited about this one. If you're a fan of sound design, electronic music, composition, anything music tech, anything creative, this is going to be a fantastic episode for you. Today, our guest is Kayla Shears. She has an amazing intro. Kayla Shears is a composer, sound designer, and elegant electronic artist from California who currently resides in Montreal, Quebec. Her education includes a college degree in communication studies from Vanier College and a bachelor's of fine arts in electroacoustic studies from Concordia University where she received five grants and awards during her studies there. Her music and hard work has allowed her to create a platform for herself in the electronic music scene across the world performing in multiple festivals such as Tribal Gathering Panama, Fractal Fest, and OZORA. She has created the first loop session WXYN event in Montreal and was a participant for the 2020 Nuit Blanche event at Le Gezu. She is the founder of East Sunrise Productions, a multidisciplinary audiovisual media creation project that undertakes many creative endeavors such as prosthetic reality, video editing, sound design, and other forms of media arts. Furthermore, she is part of the board of ELAN Quebec's Inclusion Committee representing artists with disabilities. Her work experience includes being an audiovisual technician for over three years, being a sound specialist at Rock Camp for Girls for over two years and her music production for Clown 9. These releases include Keys of Starlight, Rising Luminosity, Breathe Out, Book of Life, Magic Island, and Unveil. She also has sound credits for being a sound designer for the company Right Bloody Publishing and Chaos Lab where she was a sound designer for the short film Spark and a sound editor for the short film Jessica. Please give a warm welcome to Kayla. How are you, Kayla? Yo, thanks. I'm doing great. Doing really great. Thanks for having me. This is super exciting. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing really well. Of course, really, really it's a well. pleasure to have you on. Yeah. Good, awesome. good, good. Very happy. I want to start with you by knowing uh, when did music and audio become of importance to you? Because obviously you've done a lot over the years. <laughs> but what was the starting point of that? Well, I mean, it's, it's I have a pretty uh, wide history here. So, I, I mean, I, I'm going to have to bring you back to my teenage years when I was uh, reluctant to learn piano. Yes. Yeah, and, for sure. uh, Go back as far as you need. Yeah, I ended up playing the drums in high school, uh, which is not uh, musical, <laughs> really, for most musicians and composers. They, you know, oh, the drum drummers are like drum. the... Shots fired. <laughs> I mean, I'm firing at myself, but it's true. It's like we, because right. we don't, our theory is not the same, you know, when you learn uh, drum theory, it's not the same as piano. <laughs> Like it's it's really <laughs> not so you know I was always kind of like the the dark horse of uh, of my interest in music and technology and stuff. So like, wow. Okay. <laughs> I was just like I'm gonna play the drums. I'm gonna do what I want. I I didn't like learning piano at all. Like I, I was that reluctant child that was just a torture to deal with. Like I did not want to go to <laughs> piano lessons. I did not want to do any of this stuff. Nothing traditional fit me. And I mean it, it goes anyways uh, very along with my brain being autistic and ADHD and having sensory processing stuff. I just did not want to do anything traditional. Like there was nothing traditional that really suited me. And given that, you know, it, it just goes right in line with me playing the drums. You know, it's like, I just need to smash stuff. You know, like I just really wanted right. to smash things. I was really into punk and ska and uh, some metal actually. Like I, I was going to a lot of these shows in, in California and, you know, I was also involved into kind of like the pop alternative rock too. Like I, I found myself at, at Warped Tour on the occasion, you know, like yes. in, in the summer. Nice. It was like, yeah, like I actually snuck in there once. Like, you know, I was kind of that rebellious teen that I had to go to like four Saturday schools in a row in high school because I was I got caught ditching school going to the beach you know like I, I was like that kind of a kid but I had super high excelled grades in, in English I was always an honors student in English like ironically enough anything that revolved around like arts or contemporary arts or media arts anything non-traditional in that sense I excelled in so you know that I took up drums quite naturally you know it, it allowed me to really express myself how I wanted to but you know as I got older to be about 18 I'd say like I, I was pretty lost like I, I was also pretty depressed as a teenager I was that weird kid in school that just kind of sat in the library eating lunch like alone you know and I wasn't even allowed to eat my lunch in there but you know I was just like sneak eating my lunch like being right. on the computer at, at school like I, I literally right. did anything like I, I would be on 
fucking Neopets or some shit. You know, like I, like I, I would I be on Neopets. something other. Yo, Neopets <laughs> is the shit, man. Like, like for real. That is like yeah. it's like I loved Neopets. Like I was obsessed since a very young age. But you know, that's like at the fault of my my father for being such a tech god, like and just really into computers and like having all the computers and different types of models and stuff that you could find. So I was obviously very much entertained with the internet. Like at one point, <laughs> this is just a fun sidetrack. Like at one point when my dad would want to take the, the internet away, I was smart enough to be able to reconnect to my neighbors at the time. So I was like at like 14, 15 years old, already stealing internet. Like, <laughs> like before it became a thing. <laughs> Yo, like... <laughs> So proud, right? Like, <laughs> so much to be proud of. But yeah, so I, I ended up, uh, you know, in my teen years, I was always uh, more, I guess, attuned empathically to the world. You know, music always made me feel things. And I, and I didn't realize right. that I had synesthesia until later in my life. Like, I, okay. I didn't realize that that's like, you know, the feelings with sounds and the feelings with music and different types of bands or things that I would associate with lyrics and all that stuff. Like, I didn't realize that what I was also feeling was like on a multi level, you know, like I didn't know that I was singing right. and, and, you know, hearing differently than other people, you know, I, I didn't realize that. So I, I was like more enamored by, you know, photography at the time, like my dad oh, nice. had, uh, yeah, he gave me uh, my first DSLR when I was 14. And, and I was just obsessed. I was hooked. So I was always taking portraits of people practicing, reading manuals, That's trying awesome. out, like, you know, tr you know, working to get different lenses, things like that yeah. so like my journey in audio and music like didn't even really start there it was more with technology and like being enamored with the the exponential growth that we experienced since I mean I was born in 1990 so like you know since then it's like we just were the generation that like you know got dumped on like <laughs> we were the generation that was like okay yeah. well here's all of this and uh, you figure it out and test it and like we're just gonna see what this does to you <laughs> like in 20 years <laughs> oh my god <laughs> so I'm like look mom I'm I'm an electroacoustic musician. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> how do I like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. after all the yeah. cartoons, after all the obsession with Neopets <laughs> and fucking playing these games, like, you know, like I, I, I was really into things too. Like, um, you know, Call of Duty. Oh, yeah. I was really in. Sure. Yeah, I was like super into gaming at one point. I was uh, playing like a lot of computer games too, like computer war games, especially. Nice. Like, I, I was really into that. Like, we also have, like, I, I come from a military family on my mom's side mostly. And, uh, right. you know, like, I, I had, like, you know, my grandpa and like uncles and stuff. They were always in the war. And, like, I had kind of just grown up with this asso association with the military, you know, in some way. And, you know, I was really also very proud of this, you know, so I naturally just like went into like all of these fighter games and stuff too and I was like really amazed with like just at a young age I mean looking back at it now I'm like you know of course I wasn't really aware of all of this stuff but the prime interest was like well yeah I could do surround sound I was always like very into how movies sounded you know in in terms of their mm. scope for like how they designed like just just the whole layout and the structure and things like that you know different noises and stuff I think it like blew my mind you know when uh, I was able to like I don't know see some movies like Avatar for the first time or like you know different things that yeah. came out that really benchmarked sound design and the the new wave of like you know decade of like uh, virtual experience and, and visual experience as well so you know trailing that back to my teen years I, I was more obsessed with, with photography like I, I in high school I actually was able to take one of the first photoshop classes like I, I was like you know learning photoshop cs1 like when i was like 14 so naturally like i, I just, just was really good at using all of these computer programs and right. i just excelled you know really well into this and that just kind of gave me like a really solid grounding into music and audio but i you know the the big why is like you know how did it become important to me was i guess when i moved here you know and i was kind of placed with an ultimatum with my parents at the time when I was 19 because I went to uh, Santiago Canyon College. I was trying that out for a bit. And, uh, you know, I definitely was not interested. <laughs> like, I, I've, I've dropped out of college three times, actually, you know, since wow. uh, I was 18. Uh, yeah, like, and, and it's uh, it's crazy because, um, you know, that I have one of those stories where it's like, yeah, I just relentlessly dropped out of classes, dropped out of school, like, left and okay. right. Like, I just lost all of these interests and then just ended up doing everything autonomously on my own. So, 
you know, I was placed with an ultimatum at 19 with my parents being like, you either need to go into the Air Force or you need to get kicked out of the house or you need to go to college somewhere. Like you need to pick a place and go and figure it out, <laughs> basically, um, without uh-huh. any support, you know, from them. I, I, I mean, I was just, you know, I was very like in a depressed uh, state, you know, like I, I didn't realize that uh-huh. I was what depression was either. You know, like this is also the very much autistic reality of not being diagnosed. And we didn't even have the the proper modules to even go through that in therapy. So I was just thrown into some kind of a therapy, you know, I was causing a lot of problems at home. And, you know, I I was uh, pretty lost, you know, despite like, you know, a lot of the guidance that I had throughout the years, like I I was involved in church, different communal activities too, since a young age. Like I know Mm -hmm. like we're going to touch on some of the projects I've done in the last couple of years, but I was like, you know, supporting kids like in Malawi, you know, I was like getting people to donate money. I was like doing like monthly things things with like, you know, organizations like World Vision. I was raising money for Haiti. Like, you know, we were working with organizations there. I'd gone to Mexico on the occasions to build houses. Like Mm -hmm. there was a lot of these community projects, like, you know, going to LA Skid Row, really trying to help people. So for me, like being so outside and isolated, it kind of gave me a way to observe and understand the world from a very objective state from a young age, which is ironically what you really need with sound design and music and mixing and audio, you need this kind of objective sense of the world and what you're working on in your art projects to be able to really get the clarity and the things that you need to have done, you know, so it it ended up coming back to me and benefiting me in that way. But aside from that, like I I was very much involved on this kind of empathic level to to help people. And I felt so connected with music at that time. And even through photography, I thought that 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 was my way in, you know, so when I moved here, I ended up not going into the Air Force because I really did want to become a pilot. My dad has, Mm -hmm. you know, flown planes since he was 14. Like my great uncle was a Navy fighter pilot in the U.S. Navy. He was a part of Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. Um, He had got like several, um, you know, naval awards for uh, his attacks on enemy ships. Like he was a very big staple in terms of like, I really idealized wanting to be a Navy, like not a Navy pilot, but a a pilot in the Air Force. And it was also kind of a, a way for me to travel and to kind of have a I had a friend uh, right after high school, she ended up going into the Air Force um, and I was going to go through my tests. I met with some people to just see if this was what I wanted, but it it required a lot of complex decision making. I'm like, I wasn't guaranteed to get stationed overseas somewhere. So it was like a a more of a long term vision than I had, you know, capable of of making for myself. Like I I wasn't really capable of of making like this long term commitment to this, you know, and, and basically subsidizing my life life and everything I knew for the Air Force. So I ended up uh, moving. (laughs) I'm just like, I'm not going to live in California. I instinctively felt that there was just nothing left for me here. There was nothing left for me here. Like I I didn't want to go live in a house with six people because basically that's what you have to do. Like unless you come from a lot of money and you can afford to go live in dorms, you can go afford to live and have your own apartment, you know, basically being paid for by your parents or something like that while you're studying. I just didn't have options. Like, you know, apartments were still really expensive in Orange County where I was. And, and and just regardless, like it was just very difficult for me to get out. So I knew that, you know, embarking on this was going to open up a new career path for me. It was just an instinctive move to get out of, you know, my struggles and whatnot. Right. And it is true, you know, that they say, you know, what you run away from always follows you. So I was like, well, at least I'll just deal with less chaos, you know, or just creating less things if I'm just autonomously living alone you know, on my own. So that's what brought me to Montreal 12 years ago, which is crazy because I'm like, wow, I've been here for 12 years now. I'm like, that's, that's nuts. You know, I've, I've built up my entire life, uh, not knowing anybody. Um, I moved in with a grandmother and I mean, I, I hate to say this on recording, but like, you know, she, she really like did a lot of bad things to me. Um, when I had moved with her and, and I couldn't even last like six months, like she was charging me like $500 for rent. Like, and this is like 2009 you know in Montreal like yeah. that's absurd it's it's absurd amount of money you yeah. know and, and there
there's just like religious stuff that goes along with that because my dad was Jewish and my mom wasn't. So my whole life, I kind of dealt with this like isolation from my dad's side of the family. And uh, he also went through a crazy story. Like I, I got a lot of inspiration from my dad and my parents just because like he he's really like the, the key factor, like an example of like what it's like to come from nothing and to build up your whole image from this. And, and it's like, it's crazy because, you know, my parents, you know, and I get a lot of inspiration from my parents, but like they didn't have a lot of musical influence on me. Like they, my mom was first chair violinist at Texas University or Texas Tech, I think. And that's one of the highest, okay. like, uh, universities in the states you know it's very very world renowned recognized for orchestra and she was first chair violinist and she w- excelled at violin but once she had kids and once all of that stuff went underway I mean it was just th- their generation like they just kind of gave up on their dreams Dropped right? It. like it, it was right. just you know my dad also he created a group when he was in Montreal he played the trumpet like he was in a very well known band called Jasmine and um, you know he ended up keeping that trumpet you know until I mean I was like 20 21 you know he had this trumpet forever like he would still play on the occasion but you know they all kind of just dropped their musical gifts I'd say because they were very talented so I didn't really grow up with that like I I wish I could say that like you know my parents influenced my musical choices and my sound design choices but like they just kind of gave me the resources to be more aligned with tech and my involvement with that so you know my dad just more inspired me and influenced me that like I could really be anything that I want to be. It doesn't matter what identity, what things come in my way, I can always succeed. So when I moved here and I was having all these difficulties and obviously I didn't speak French at the time. (laughs) You know, I I basically like a fun side story is like my first job here was working at a shoe store called Chouchou. <laughs> and like CHU, oh. CHU, you know, this, this like stupid. Yeah, yeah. Like, and it was this like really, really bougie place, like in Rockland Shopping Center. So I was basically okay. taking like 30 minutes just to get there by bus, you know. And um, I worked there faking a British accent just so that I no. didn't. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm serious. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. That is, like, that's funny. That's what I had to do. <laughs> oh, jeez. So yeah, I was selling shoes like this and when people would approach me, I would be trying to sell them the shoe with a an English accent. <laughs> Why? Why the English accent? <laughs> I, you know, because people Did wouldn't just judge me so much. It just came to me in the moment and I'm like, I fucking know that like this is bullshit, you know? Like oh I just my God. like I mean, I'm like, how can anybody buy this? But like, you know, some people are like, oh, that's pretty good. I'm like, yeah, if you're not British. <laughs> like, oh, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> but that was. The- <laughs> I can just picture an actual <laughs> English person coming in. And like, who the fuck is this person? <laughs> Stop mocking me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dude. Yeah, for real. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm like, I'm like, you know, maybe some French people can buy it, you know, but they also hate each other. So I'm kind of like, I'm pinned, you know, but I'm like, I can't like, I'm like, bonjour, como, sava kind of, you know, like my, my, my California accent was so thick at that point. (laughs) <laughs> like mm-hmm. it was so thick and uh like i i just couldn't get around it any other way so i was just like I, I was just winging it man like when i got here i'm like i just need to make some money like i need to figure out how to fucking pay 500 dollars of rent you know like to just live with your grandmother like it's pretty obscene to pay that much yeah. you know and, and obviously the rest of my family didn't know about that <laughs> until i told them i was like mm-hmm. i totally thought that everybody was like this was the thing but i'm like isn't that a lot of money to be paying at 19 like so um I ended up, uh, you know, just leaving that situation, that very toxic situation. Um, And I I moved out um, and I was still at Vanier. And and the funny thing at Vanier, too, is until a year and a half into that degree, he's like, why did you go to Vanier? I talked to a counselor and he's like, why are you here? Like, why didn't you just like go to a university or like McGill or something? And Mm. and I'm just like, this isn't a college. Like, this isn't like a regular like community college. Because I'm like, I always wondered why I was older than 
than everybody. Like, why was I like 19 and everybody was 17? You know, and I just thought it was just a grade difference, like between Canada and the States. But actually, right. I didn't even I, I could have just skipped Sage Up, you know. But yeah. I mean, then, you know, I wouldn't have met the people that ended up getting me into music and into electronic yeah. stuff and all of that jazz. So right. it was very much aligned with my life path to be there. But I was kind of like salty, like <laughs> at the end of it being mm. like, I didn't really need to do this, you know, like, <laughs> but I took a lot of really cool, cool courses. Yeah. Like I, I really excelled and like I, I but, did like. Um, I, the, the, the advantage <laughs> of going to CJEP is just like, it's so cheap, you know? Exactly. It's so yeah. cheap and you can figure out if you like something and if you do it's yeah, like okay the next yeah. step is university yeah after so, i was salty i ended yeah. up realizing that i was like after the salt kind of got washed away you know i was like okay actually yeah. I, I i definitely don't regret this degree at all because i i did some really amazing uh classes you know just in in photography journalism figured out some creative writing stuff and you know nice. then i was i was just like obviously still very much obsessed with photography and, and whatnot so i was thinking of like photojournalism and stuff but then it, it just totally changed when I went to my first rave party. <laughs> I moved out. <laughs> Tell us more about that. <laughs> it was uh, about a year. Yeah, like I'm like, you kind of know where this is going. <laughs> like, yeah. A kind of year yeah. uh, after after I, I got into a lot of this stuff, I was like, all right, I'm finishing my shit. Like I, I didn't really need to be there for the full two years or whatever. So I, I um, was finishing some stuff and I met this girl and uh, she was like go really into drugs. <laughs> like, And I'm like, I just just want to take drugs i mean honestly like it's it's was just this like angst you know in me this like depression mm. and kind of like i want to be involved in a community but i don't know i was always i always liked electronic music but i was more like i said into ska and punk and like going to these you know beach ska shows you know like it just in california that's just it was the lifestyle that i was living in you know so i didn't really mm. go to like electronic raves like i, I was listening right. to like you know um fucking sandstorm or some shit <laughs> The roots, <laughs> you know, like, like this kind of wow. shit. <laughs> you know, so it's it's like you know, take like that. Kind, that was like my only really exposure to like yeah. electronic music. I, at that that time. song slaps. It still holds up. Yeah, it does though. It does though, it right? Like <laughs> it's so fucking catchy. Like you know, like I, yeah. I it really does. So it, it's like I, I, I'd say like you know that's where it kind of like started. You know, was like this like I just need to get out. I just I was trying to discover who I was, which I mean your identity and just I mean your identity changes. It can change. You can have multiple identities of like representing who you are, but it's not who you are. But at twenty mm -hmm. nineteen mm -hmm. to twenty, I didn't realize that. You know, I didn't think about you know that that deep into who I was yet I just thought that life was this existence I was always like you know enthused with philosophy and going into very deep philosophical studies I was like obsessed with like quantum mechanics and all of this kind of stuff like I, I had like a you know a very deep relationship with God like I think my whole life you know I'd say that it transcended different aspects of like versions of spirituality and studies you know over over my time but I'd say like you know most of what I was was going through like at 20 was just this like loss of like wholeness you know I, I just didn't know like what it meant to be really connected to myself or to other right. people and again this is like you know undiagnosed classic autism ADHD stuff but at the same time you know it created a lot of suffering so I went to these rave parties you know obviously like you know I I took like a ecstasy for the first time I was like you know into MDMA but like it was wasn't really what drew me to music like it was just kind of a segue you know and, and I was um you know really like I just went all in like I was like you know what I fucking love this and you know I ended up here you know starting to download and pirate some music from like Russian websites and you know I at the time I was living in um, a church off of I don't know if you guys have passed like Rosemont and Papino yeah this street so yeah. there's like I a know, fucking exactly. weird ass know, yeah. church. The, do you know this church? Yeah. Do you know this church? Yeah. I no, lived I've there for it. like two. Yo, <laughs> it's sketchy as fuck, man. This church is wild. Like I, they turned it into kind of like subsidized housing. Like the the father oh, okay. that the father lived there, oh. like downstairs in like his little quarters. It was okay. like wild. But I was paying like two seventy a month for rent at one point. Like it, it was really low. I think I started yeah, paying that's like because it was like very like communal living. Like we all shared a kitchen, but like I had my own 
own bathroom and shower. Like I had my own shower. The rooms were quite large, but um, yeah, like I ended up moving there like just less than a year, you know, after um, I moved here. So it was quite a transition going from fucking Rosemont to Cover to study, you know, and uh, yeah, just it's quite a commute. Mm. Yeah, it was a huge commute, but I, I was taking all that time to read. I was taking all that time to listen to music and just kind of really like practice, like, I, I mean, unknown ear training. Like I didn't realize that's what I was doing in terms of that depth of listening. But, you know, I started out like with my commutes because it was like 30, 45 minutes just to get to class. And I was also holding down like two jobs at the same time. I was like busing like mm -hmm. uh, tables at this bougie sushi shop, Kaizen Sushi um, on so cool. Atwater. You were, you were just like unconsciously doing ear training. Yeah, yeah, unconsciously. That's awesome. Like I, I was really studying the music. Like I was like, okay, like really, really hearing it. I mean, obviously my background in, in percussions was, was quite obsessive because I really liked the layering and how you could just uh, go so far um, with being able to build up a track with like so many layers of percussions and so many different layers of, of things and noises and stuff. So when I started getting into trans music and, you know, going in between my jobs, like I, I was like working at cafes, also trying to get by with the whole French thing. Like I was going in between jobs so many times and trying to hold down so many jobs. But the one thing that kind of held me together like glue was music. And then, you know, I had seen, um, you know, a DJ, her name is Polyphonica, and she started DJing. She's from Mexico, and it was the first female that I saw DJ ever, really. There was one, we had DJ Absolute that was here and in Montreal, and she was often playing Psytrance and stuff. But I, I didn't really like the full-on nice. Psytrance. Like, I wasn't really into that at the time. I was more into the darker kind of Psy, like the stuff that kind of mimicked the metal, the, the kind of ska, the screamo music. Like, I was more into the dark kind of variations of Psytrance, you know, per se. So Polyphonica wasn't necessarily... Yeah into the full-on but she was on a different spectrum where it wasn't so full-on and I could really get into it so I was like I have to fucking do this I have to DJ I just had to so in 2010 I, I just like I knew that that's what I had to do like it was just another instinctual pull towards this and it, it's like it wasn't the drugs it wasn't any of this I mean obviously like I was just you know going along with most of the crowd and just trying to find myself and who I was but you know essentially like I you know was doing everything that I could to just buy a laptop to upgrade from my uh, old Toshiba. <laughs> oh my. my! I had an old Toshiba that I downloaded Reason 4 and Ableton like nice. 6 or 7 or something. Like again, I cracked them. I was just doing whatever it took to like learn. And um, yeah, like I, I didn't have anybody to really teach me. I was just like, okay, well, what is this? And I had a friend who was doing his sound degree at UCAM at the time. So I was like, can you just like show me what, what the fuck reason is and like how I can like do a side chain compression with like, you know, the virtual like wires and cables, you know, right? Like you, I don't know if any, if you guys have opened up a reason but it's basically yeah. like you, yeah you have yeah. like uh, you have your stack there and it's like you have your rack and you just have to wire it so I basically started understanding like the logistics of like what making like you know a path is you know in in sound or just trying to make yeah, like, signal you flow. know something coming out just any kind yeah. anything just any kind of signal flow yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> then I just started doing whatever I could to learn how to DJ. So at the time, like I was so fucking poor. I was basically like, you know, just choosing between like Depener bread, like for me and like other groceries that I could afford from like the IGA down the street. And like, just like buying speakers, <laughs> you know, or like, you know, we, I, I ended up starting to learn on like a Hercules DJ controller. Like, I, I mean, it was just, you know, my, my partner at the time, like we were trying to afford some stuff like you know and ironically like he was living right next to me like and, and I, I was just like you know okay well we can share this kind of stuff you know if we can afford it but most of the time I was just the one buying it and um, you know utilizing what I could with the money that I had to learn and self-teach myself so then by yeah like I guess it started to become really important for me around 2011 like when I started to get mm. really serious about music was 
at the tail end of that degree at Vanier, I was like, this is what I really want to do. Like I wasn't motivated at Vanier anymore at all. So okay. I was like, I really just like, I, I had dropped out like of so many different things, you know, like I, I, I ended up just being like, you know what, I want to commit to this. And that's kind of like when it really became important was when I started to see nice. that I'm like, I have potential here, nice. you know, and I just went for it. I just went all in and I was like, okay, no, I need to make this mm -hmm. like, you know, my life, you know, like my life. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, and like when did that? Like from the moment you decided that's what you liked, when did you decide to go to Concordia, right? So, so <laughs> you were at Vanier and then <laughs> when did you decide to uh, go to Concordia? How did you find the program, uh, Electroacoustics? <laughs> so the second time I dropped out was shortly after that. Like, and I applied to Concordia and to, uh, well, I would consider I was dropping out of Vanier too. Like I went back to just complete that degree. So I did drop out. Like okay. I had to go back to finish uh, like a oh, like see. a class yeah. of French, you know. Like okay. I basically had to, to complete get your, that in order to get the thing. But they're like, you can just do it this way, and I, I could just, you know, it was really easy for me to do. But yeah. um, I didn't finish it that year. Like I didn't actually get like anything. <laughs> that year I just dropped out and I was like fuck this I'm going to music and I just changed like so <laughs> the third time I dropped out of college actually was when I went into an anthropology program just as like independent studies just to get in you know to Concordia and I didn't even realize about EA or about any of electro like any of that stuff either like I wasn't aware but I ended up dropping out of Concordia and already having my files open and stuff for applications in like 2013 something like this 2012 it was around that time I was kind of like my mom was pressuring me like what are you doing <laughs> like what are you doing why are you wanting to go around and playing at parties and like talking about DJing like it, they just didn't understand so I was like I just knew what I was feeling and I knew that I had to do this and I was like okay well fuck school for the moment I'm just gonna go back when I really know what I want to do and I ended up dropping right. out again for the third time so like <laughs> I just that, that's <laughs> a smart thing to do like just go back once you're ready once you're truly ready yeah, it really is. And a lot of people don't take the time yeah. to figure out their what they really want. And 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 when I tell people, I'm like, you know, for me, it became clear also after a lot of healing work, it came after a lot of therapy, it came after a lot of like spiritual paths and, and ventures, both inwards and outwards, you know, into being like, okay, this is what I really want to do because I know who I am and who I am has become clear. Past identities that don't actually represent me, past what people think of me, past what I even think of about myself because often we're our own worst critics right so for me I was like up against this is a guy's world you know like most of the events that I was playing at, I was the only female so it was like kind of hard to like also find my place and like my I guess quote unquote identity you know in, in DJing you know I had my cloud nine identity and my you know whole like charisma around like what I was presenting on stage but I was like that's not really who I am it's a part of who I am but who I am is far deeper and more complex than that. So deciding to go back to school, you know, and really having the clarity around what I wanted to do came after a lot of internal work, you know, that I didn't get to as a teenager. You know, a lot of us don't like it's just trauma and like figuring out, you know, your life shit. Like it's very difficult to go through that unless you have like guide or, you know, sometimes money. Like it was difficult. Like sometimes some weeks I was like, okay, I need to pay yeah. 80 bucks for this therapy, but it's really going to affect my work as, you know, a DJ or whatever the clarity I need to move forward because I really wanted to connect into that. So a lot of that, you know, and getting to Concordia eventually in 2016 after I had established my music career, you know, that's that's kind of where it came, you know, was was after establishing myself and really discerning like, okay, this is what I want to do, you know, because a part of me getting to Concordia was feeling like there's a lot of discrepancies and there were a lot of problems in the trans community. Like there, there were a lot of things that I saw as I traveled and as I played at festivals and as I got bookings and as I was managing my own stuff that I was like, well, you know, it, there was a lot of unfair things, you know, that unfair advantages that I saw other people had, you know, like they were getting paid more than me, even though I was playing a live set or, you know, other people, it was just kind of a, a club, like a, a, you know, a boys club in a way. But like, I mean, there were some, you know, girls involved in that too, in the lineups, but not many, like we weren't as connected as we are today. And I mean, that's a lot of thanks to some of the programs and, and networking communities that I started with.
in 2013. So I had pioneered with uh, an artist called Cy Bindi. Her name's Rana. She's in uh, London, the UK. And uh, she ended up starting Cy Sisters. And I, I jumped on to basically expand that networking capability. And we ended up affecting like pr- a lot of lot of women and and performers and uh, trans women especially you know we were really like in- inclusive to that giving people a base to connect on because we, we just it didn't exist before so I saw the problems that I was experiencing and I'm like okay well I can I can fix that I can do something about that so I did and then that ended up growing over the next five six years and I also at the right. same year was working um, in Brazil at the time with Maya Brazil records which is like a lot of the releases like our singles like breathe out or unveil those were were on this label as well and I had compiled like two various artist albums two VAs for them a couple you know of things and I was doing all their artist management um, I was doing project management and stuff for um, size sisters and you know just really saying like okay well I see there's a missing connect and a link with people who have to build themselves up so I was already kind of doing like international artist management like and unknowingly doing like tons of networking and stuff Wow. and um, I ended up connecting a lot of people and they they have very successful careers now. Um, they're still playing at parties, and it's really nice to see some artists that you know I found through SoundCloud just digging. You know, like finding people who like stuff, different types of musicians, different types of yeah. artists and stuff that you know aren't known. So I took the liberty to say, hey, I see like where you're going and I see the bigger picture of your music and I really want to take you in and have you release something for me. So I, every VA that I did, I ended up taking a lot of artists from people that I looked up to, you know, that I wanted to see myself play next to one day, you know, so I just threw myself into the fire and I ended up making it like I ended up really establishing myself into this world of electronic music because I just was like you know what I really want to release them so I'm going to make a VA myself and ask them to be a part of the project and so I ended up at a very early age like of 23 22 releasing my first various artists album internationally with uh, Glitchy Tonic Records um, in Germany there's in Berlin and um, then I ended up you know just getting all of these artists that I looked up to talking to me and I was like yo like I'm actually That's like talking to that must have been guys. so cool oh my God. yo oh my so goodness. cool so cool that like, I, like I was like <laughs> Wow. fangirling wow. yeah of course. Full, of course yeah for sure. full fangirling like yeah. you know there's an artist Merkaba like he also he runs his own label now Merkaba Music and he was one of like on my first VA I was able like I was able to network a track from him and this was like life changing like I got all these artists that I, I really intended I'm like I need them to be on this it was called Multidimensional Merge I released it on December like 21st like 2012 so I was like really into the numerology at the time like just being like you know what I'm I'm gonna go in like I'm gonna like you know create this album like I ended up releasing a track uh later with um Radioactive Cake which is the owner of Glitchy Tonic Records and uh he is also in Berlin I mean it's his label so yeah <laughs> course it's there but he ended up working with me after that and that was really cool and we ended up putting a track together for that VA and it was just amazing like and it still holds like true today like the track's just bawling like it was just really really amazing to work with him so I ended up just putting myself into the fire at the at, a, at the very beginning you know just being like you know what I want to get there so I'm going to put myself there and I'm going to put myself where I need to grow and I'm going to put myself in their shoes and just say you know what I do have the tenacity to work with these people because that's where I'm going anyway so Might as well start now. And um, that kind of just catapulted my uh, release schedule. It, it, you know, every year I was releasing something and just making sure that I was current, whether it was singles, whether it was like participating in other VAs, other labels that wanted to release a track or two from me. So it was, it was pretty nice of an experience to get into that. Um, well, what's your experience been like DJing and touring around the world? Um, about 2013 was when I invested into my first music tour in Europe. Like I just put down like $1,500. Mm. You know, I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put myself out there. I ended up networking, being like, look, I'm going to be stationed in Paris. So I chose like a location point where they could fly me in from that's mm-hmm. cheaper than like Montreal. You know, I'm like, yeah. because it's harder to get gigs if I'm like just in Montreal and they have to fly me overseas and stuff every single time. Sure. So I was like, I'm going to be here for three months. So I put myself there. I bought my flight ticket. I ended up going, you know, in 2011, I had gone to Trans-Sahara Festival, which is in Morocco, in the Sahara 
Sahara Desert and I just fell in love. I was like, the next time this happens, I have to play there. So how do I have to play there? Well, I need other gigs first. So I ended up investing in myself, you know, and, you know, two years later, how I was able to do that was, you know, I, I got all of these other bookings. I was able to get a press release and then I ended up getting that booking at Trans Sahara, like the next time I was there. And I was like, I was in the main stage lineup playing after Saturday night, you know, in the fir- perfect morning sunrise. It was perfect for my music. It was just the most amazing dance floor I could have asked for. And I mean, it's like I've lived like that some of these incredible amazing. experiences and like very remote locations just by throwing myself into the fire and being like, you know what? Fuck this. Fuck the odds. I'm going to go and do this and I'm going to make sure that this happens for me. And, you know, there were a lot of difficulties, a lot of people getting in your way to trying to tear you down because either they're not believing in themselves enough, you know, or like they can't allow your success to happen because they're not successful or something. You know, so I dealt with a lot of this, especially as a woman. So it was like, I had to really trailblaze here. Like I was like, I had to do it myself because it was difficult to trust other people to manage me. You know, so I basically just did my own management and I was able to fucking play in Bulgaria that year. I played in Czech that year. I played um, in Morocco that year. I played in Paris. Like it, it was like 2013 was a very successful year for me to be able to go to these remote locations to just like say, you know what, I'm offering my DJ sets. I kick ass and I know what I'm doing. And I also was like pioneering like a very new form of progressive trance. Like it it wasn't well known here. It was very big, more in Australia bush scene. Like, you know, in their bush scene, it's like basically like forest parties. You know, like that's what they they call the bush out there. It's like, you know, when you have a bush party, it's like uh, basically in the forest, like they're just throwing up music, kind of like a punk show. You know, like it's kind. It was kind of like that vibe. You know, like very like free flowing. Like just come as you are. Kind of just you know, you're there to dance. You're there to let go and feel good. And um, I really wanted that in Montreal, especially. And I really wanted that like international. So I was one of the first DJs actually to pioneer dark progressive trance. And when I say dark, it just means that it's more psychedelic and less full on. So there was a lot more detailing in terms of the sound design, and especially in terms of the layering and the techniques that you're using to develop your bass lines. Uh, There was like more, I guess, variations in terms of breaks, you know, uh, bass lines in terms of how you could develop your highs, lows, like all all of these things. It was just a whole spectrum of exploration, you know, and and it was really great to just learn, you know, and and throw myself into. So I, I started like looking and plugging myself into all these artists. And after I was doing all this networking and stuff, I really like created a niche of how I do my DJ sets. I I was just making each set like its own art piece, you know, and and people were like, you know it's very divided like do you play like live dj sets like do you just pick the music like with the crowd and i was like kind of i did that sometimes but most of the time i was like going through the keys and making sure everything was matched and i wanted to tell a story with my dj sets and that's it it really trails into how i do my art now is i'm I'm really telling a story there's always a deeper meaning always a deeper reflective modality that comes into anything that i do or touch on so I, i i really found myself in that being like i I want to create a space for people to be able to let go and have that initiative to expand who they are on the dance floor to just be as they are so that that mm-hmm. can become a closer reality to them because I was so separated from my own self for so long and even with autism now and knowing who I am and knowing all of the stuff with the stature and and uh, resiliency I guess that I have you know it still feels sometimes that I'm like living in a glass box and this is a project that I'm taking into the next year actually with sound design it's pretty fucking sweet um, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but like, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's really cool how all of these things paralleled because I just trusted my intuition and, and really saw that scope of like, okay, I want to put meaning into music and sound and into what I'm doing. So this is an opportunity for me to do that. And eventually, you know, because of the ornate, I guess, way of, of designing sound with, with this genre of trance music, it's literally what got me into school. <laughs> Like, it's literally like my portfolio. And I have a really interesting story about Eldad too um, and how I got into EA because at that point, at 2016, I had made like four tours already with my music and I was already, I did Europe three times. I had been to Morocco twice. I had been uh, through like America as well. Like I was in Colorado. I played like some gigs in New York. I was like kind of bouncing around the States. Like, you know, even in Canada, I had performed at a festival that I really looked 
up to. And these festivals have like four or 5,000 people. Ozora had like about 25 to 30,000 people that year. Boom Festival also was like 60,000 people. Like it's like huge, huge, huge festivals with like giant names. So I really achieved what I wanted to do like in five years time. Like I really achieved everything that I wanted in about five, six years time. And when 2016 rolled around, it was a really tough year for me that year and especially traveling. And I was kind of like just, I, I saw a lot of like in between the lines, you know, like I was like, okay, well, I don't really like how there's like some hypocrisy in the communities and stuff. Like there was a lot of misogyny. There was a lot of things that I really had a hard time getting out of and removing myself from. I, at the time too, I had stopped doing drugs. So around 25, I was like, I'm not doing any psychedelics anymore. I'm not going to be taking this stuff. Like if anything, it's it's just like an occasional thing because I was really deep into my spiritual work at the time. I had paid my way to do like five years of like contemporary shamanic studies in Toronto. They were like intensive weekends. So if you can imagine between traveling and doing my sound design, working at home on tracks, music and networking, I was also working jobs <laughs> and I was doing intensive studies. So like about six to eight times a year, I would go by train to Toronto on the weekend. So I would leave like Thursday night. It would be Friday, Saturday, Sunday from like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. learning and doing like, you know, internal growth and development work, you know, and it it's, was a great segue into a lot of other spiritual practices. Like I ended up studying Buddhism, Chinese medicine, like herbalism and getting like very deep into like, you know, different levels of, of, of spiritual work at the time. So I was like, I'm really done with drugs and I'm really like done with with this kind of like I don't want to be a part of this and I know to be a successful professional I'm like I right. can't live like that you know and I watched over the years like just how people changed you know with the substance abuse and like the lack of ability to call people out like even people who were like really bad promoters like I had you know the like there was a gig in uh and, and it was in that same year it was about 2017 so this was after I got accepted into EA at that time. But, uh, you know, like as an example, like I was at this um, festival in Switzerland and it was just like really difficult for me to, to get by these types of situations with promoters because they would flirt with me. They were like, you know, after oh, I no. played this gig. That's, oh, that's gross. Yeah, that's... it's super gross. Like I get a WhatsApp message from uh, a promoter yeah. being oh. like, hey, sweetie, hi, honey, that's kind of stuff. Up. And I'm just like, it's just fucking gross. And I had dealt with that so much that it's like, you know, if I don't say yes to a gig or if I have a problem problem with my time slot I basically just don't play and I basically just watch like my guy counterparts do like a DJ set on Ableton Live and get paid that's more than me up. when it's my own work you know and I'm just like that's not very fair you know and, and it, it really is messed up it's completely messed up like it, it's it's really like it, it's it's just awful and I had a huge problem because for me being autistic also I'm very raw <laughs> and like very practical logical I my brain works in extremes like I it's like on off type of coding language you know so I'm like when you bring in emotions when you bring in all thoughts stuff it doesn't mean I don't have empathy but it actually means I feel everything including all the other stuff that I can't filter out so for me it became a problem not to be able to express that and it became a problem for me to have such authority especially with the labels I was running all the recognition I achieved I had a huge following as well you know at the time to just like be able to speak out about it and I reached out to some other you know women promoters or just other people who were doing music and they would never risk it they just didn't risk it. They didn't want to put the risk because it would right. compromise too much of their booking possibilities. You know, they they didn't want to have these things removed if they were to out some promoters or like DJs who were rapists, things like this. So I was like, this is just really not cool, you know, and I was playing at eco festivals and they would leave trash everywhere. You know, there Jesus. was just people like snorting ketamine in the corner, like in garbage. Like, and I'm just like, I mean, you know, some of them weren't that bad, but like a lot of them were very wasteful you know and I'm like you see people like leaving their tents and leaving all of this garbage and stuff and I'm like it, it's not necessarily the festival's fault but it's it's the consumer's fault like I, I always go back to it's not really the structure in place it's the consumer and the individual I'm very much in line with that belief system that it really goes back to the individual effort and based on that you know I felt that there just weren't enough people that were really supporting being able to bring all of that stuff to light so me with a big ass mouth and like you know just not having filters I got into some 
trouble. You know, like I, I got into some trouble, but I didn't back down. And I ended up creating like a whole like wave of like people and women who were really starting to come together to be to talk about this kind of stuff because it was just awful. Like you have these promoters who are very gross, like and would book people like if they would sleep with them or you know, and That's it's a very so real reality up. that people just still even today, I'm just like, wow, like it's just absolutely it, it's just really messed up, like to have to go through. And I'm like, you know, it, it's it's not to say like because I'm not like I, I'm not like totally for having, you know, affirmative action in most cases, but in some cases, I'd like to see it happen more, you know, because I, I do believe that everybody should have, you know, the equal opportunity to have talent displayed and to, you know, I, I, I like competition and I like the ability to develop your tenacity through it. Because, you know, if, if I'm going to say, well, all of my hardships just amounted to nothing, well, then, you know, they would just amount to nothing. But I was like, you know, it, it developed a lot of tenacity in me to really overcome a lot of things, even in my degree and stuff, uh, when I ended up making it to EA. <laughs> So after 2016, you know, I was like, you know what, I'm going to apply into school and I'm going to try this program out. I had a friend who went into the EA program, like kind of in their beginning stages, like he was going through school while I was doing music and he was also an artist and uh, re made really amazing techno music. I was also involved in that scene too, um, you know, because they always just cross lines with each other when you're at festivals, you have different stages and whatnot. So I was connected with a lot of these genres and he ended up going there. So I ended up wanting to pursue my education because I, I I knew what he was doing. I also saw the jobs that he was getting. Like he, he I mean, they were just work from home, kind of remote jobs, fixing right. softwares, you know, and taking calls to fix stuff for people. Okay, I see. So what other jobs did you do when you were a student? Um, my jobs were taking care of kids. I worked as a security guard agent. I was doing like barista work for so long, um, you know, and at the time I was getting involved in the third wave coffee movement, like training myself as a barista barista under like you know this dude who had like 14 years of experience so I ended up just like getting taken under his wing to like apprentice for like a couple months and that set me off into another career point of being like okay well I could actually like live and study like work and study at the same time so I, I mean it was just so much complexity in there and in, in those years of like discovery trying to get out of like toxic relationships and situations because like at the time too like I had a an abusive relationship with my ex-boyfriend oh. um, you know and, and he really talked down to my educational pursuit like he he didn't support really what I was doing and and you know he, he kind of thought it was me like being like you know I, I was prideful about my career status and stuff and and it's it's just crazy because he never went anywhere with me like that's, I had played in like over 13 countries or 13 you know like it, and I'm just like you never went anywhere with me never like he never okay. traveled to any gigs was never there you know and, and like we had like broken up on and off it, it was not healthy at all you know and um, it, it's difficult because you know in those relationships and stuff you don't really know how bad it is until you get out and to get Absolutely. out you have to see a level of value and self-worth and who you are right to be like you know what i'm choosing myself yeah, know because your that's worth. what it yeah. comes down to is you're choosing yourself over suffering you know and yeah exactly exactly you know and, and so my pursuit and push into ea was also to get out of that like it, it was like a very tenacious move of like i'm gonna establish something so that i literally have no excuse or any other say like reason to stay you know so i just i, I ended up getting into audio just because and just going into that pursuit for my studies and making my portfolio and just being like i hope that electronic music is enough because i was like maybe it's too blase maybe i have to create something maybe I have to like you know actually yeah. do some academic shit you know in, in the sound world right. which I had nothing I had no formal theory training I had no training like in any type of audio environment at that point as I said I had like many different types of jobs that I was trying to hold down and like just support myself and just pay for all of my other things and schooling and speakers and things that I needed to develop myself and you know like the year that I finally bought Ableton though that was amazing <laughs> like, course, the year that course. i finally paid for ableton <laughs> just like the year that i finally was able to not work with cracked version softwares like that that was a that was a benchmark for me you know but um yeah like that that came uh after i you know got into school and it was funny because 2016 like after i got 
Like, I first got a denial letter, if you can believe it. Like, I actually got a denial letter from Concordia. Yeah, I still have it. I still have the letter from Mark (laughs) Corwin. Like, you know, the the general, like, you haven't been accepted. Yeah, that's discouraging. And I was just like, fuck. So I was super depressed for, like, a day or two days. And then, like, the week, not even a week later, I get a second email. And I was like, is this a sick joke? They took back (laughs) their refusal? What? No way. (laughs) They took, yes. Like, Are you serious? I'm not kidding. I st- I have the proof. Oh like I God. fucking swear. Oh and even Eldad can vouch goodness. for me. I was denied first. How does that even happen? I was denied first <laughs> in the degree. I was denied. I know, right? It's This is just my life, oh, man. man. Like ha- so a lot of funny. these things that I've lived, I'm like, how does this even happen? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how do I even know what I'm doing? Like, <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah sure. so- <laughs> it was just that's so wow. crazy because actually not many people know that about me that I was actually refused. Did they ever give from you the an program in 2016? I don't, I don't get that. Yeah, I, okay. like, I know. Just, just for a minute here. <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah, did they ever tell uh, you? So, like, well, okay. well, like there was the explanation yeah. from Eldad, like face oh, to wow. face, and then there was the explanation in the letter that they sent me. So the the letter, like, I'm wondering if I could like pull it up because this is really funny. Like, it's just one of those very odd stories that you hear about people, and like, you know, when they're establishing themselves in like new careers or whatever. Yes. I'm just like, yeah, you know, they oh, actually man, refused funny. me. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. And I was like, this has to be a joke. Right. Like that. And I, I'm like, this is real. Like, I, I think I replied. I'm like, is this real? Like, or is this a joke? Like it, before I say yes, is this like for sure? This isn't like spam or some shit. You have the right. <laughs> you have the right do, you, do you have the right Kayla? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I was just like, is this the right thing? Like, do you have the right person? Because I'm like, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so we have carefully reviewed your application, and this was April 15th, 2016. And we regret to inform you that you have been refused admission to the following oh, program. No. <laughs> Bachelor of Fine Arts, major in electroacoustic studies, minor, minor oh. in creative writing, mature entry program. Like, it was just all these things, you know, I was like, fuck. I was like, fuck. Okay. So that was like Tony Cuco, like <laughs> signed. You know, it's like, oh my God, like, thank you for your interest in electroacoustic studies, blah, blah, blah. Please contact me, Dr. Mark Corwin. And so then, <laughs> like, seven fucking days later, like, on April fucking 22nd, like, I'm not fucking joking. This is ridiculous. Like, you have. <laughs> like this is what you need to get in and da 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 <laughs> I'm like we are pleased to announce that you have been accepted and there was like this fucking apology you know like we're really sorry we would you know we had like two spaces drop out but we also found the capacity to add a few more students oh my god <laughs> I was like fuck you that's but like, like also yes some sick delayed <laughs> <April> <laughs> For real, like, I, like it was just, you know, and so then later a face to face with Eldad completed the picture, you know, and he fought for me, dude, like he actually, he reviewed my whole application again. And he's just like, this girl needs to be an EA because like also what he was seeing in my music production and with like the level of quality that I was working in. And, and just because it was so for psychedelic, sure. the music that I was producing, it required sound design. Like it, it's not, it wasn't just composing music. It wasn't just, you know, uh, making a baseline and calling it a day. Like there was a lot of layers right. and complexity that I added to stuff, you know? So he actually saw through that because everyone else basically was just like, like, we don't want beat makers. <laughs> so, you know, but I had a pretty serious, lengthy, you know, application. And uh, yeah, yeah. Eldad, yeah, Eldad was like, we need to include her in the program. <laughs> So he basically for it, like he basically pressured them to have them, re, you know, reaccept me and, uh, you know, not refuse me. <laughs> so I get like an email, you mm-hmm. know, like, fucking, you know, a week later, just being like, do sorry, uh, do you still want yes. the, the accept? Do you still <laughs> like, yeah, it, it says that he, they basically said, we want to know if you're still interested in the program and if you want <laughs> a spot. And I was like, fuck you. But yes, like, <laughs> really? Okay, I see. I see. Uh, 
Yeah, so so Eldad basically was just like, you know, we uh, we need to get her in the program, and uh, voila. I was like, yeah, I, I want to do that. I'm starting in September, and um, <laughs> I was celebrating. Hell yeah. I was just like, Hell yeah. yeah, I got myself into school with music, like <laughs> with electronic music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and now that now that you're out of Concordia for it's been two years now because I remember graduating with you. What are your projects like now outside of Concordia? What do you work on mostly oh, now? Because so obviously live audio is different. Yeah, like let's get into like all of that. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. This is juicy stuff. Essentially, what I'm I've been working on now because I I got into DaVinci software like last year. I was like, you yeah. know, I really want to teach myself video editing, and because I'm like I had a, I have a lot of sound design stuff, so I'm like. I really need to, you know, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I have the capacity to just add what I want and learn it and be good at it and develop my efficacy in uh, whatever DAW or software I'm learning. So I decided to take it upon myself to start video editing because I had a lot of sound pieces and and I'm like, well, I don't want to like also just consistently work with other people because I have a very broad uh, range of, of vision. Like my, my vision's pretty wide. So sometimes it's it's difficult to work with somebody who's trying to pitch in your your vision and stuff for, for graphics or for, you know, mm. stuff like that. And I also didn't have the budget, but I, I really wanted to learn it. You know, and I, I was really versed already in Photoshop, doing photography or whatever for years. So I was like, you know what? Let me just figure this out, you know, and, and try to to cross discipline uh, this area of my professional life um, and my career so that took off uh, and that was really cool because in 2020 I was like doing the sound design for uh, chaos labs and um, then I was doing like some other small projects here and there you know that was the year 2020 after like a decade I decided to pause and just you know close my cloud nine projects so that I could rebrand and, and transition into e sunrise um, which also brands into e sunrise okay. Productions, uh, which is what I'm labeling myself as now, um, which ties into, you know, like I, I have under East Sunrise is my new artist alias. And uh, essentially East Sunrise Productions is is my involvement in many different types of projects. So with my personal collections and things that I'm doing, I have like a niche of, of what I'm working on that deals with polarity and, and complexity, you know, and, and also my sound pieces, you know, things that I've presented as well to different conferences, you know, they, they mostly revolve around, you know, either autism or you know very complex ideas like I, I made like a, an installation o around um, the concept of the theory of relativity from Einstein you know and and I made like a piece that you know was basically like an example of like time stretching and what it would be like if like one I don't know if you know that theory of the twins like you know one twin would be on earth and the other one would be in space but the twin would age and, and it would age like you know 80 years and the, mm, the okay. other twin that would come back to space ends up you know, um, being the same age. So I had to deal with like time dilation and stuff. So I took that into like my sound design stuff and like tried to create like a, I created like a 25 minute sound piece for that. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I had like other ideas for this. Like I wanted to start working in cinema 4D and to like, you know, I, I wanted to get that projected onto like a 3D projection film, which creates like any projection that you put onto that flat piece of acrylic with the film in it, it would make it like you're looking at something like virtually 3D, essentially. Like, you know, it, it's, right. it was really cool. So I had that idea. I started that around like 2018, towards the end of the degree, actually. You know, and it led me into a whole other world of discoveries of, of like music technology and also prosthetic reality, which it just denotes the, the presence of electronics in a space. You know, prosthetic reality is, mm. is you're using something to create an experience for someone else that, that wouldn't otherwise be generated without the use of electronics. Electronics. Like, you know, you can't recreate right. that through any other medium. So I was really like, I want to create full bound experiences for people with prosthetic reality. Like I want to be doing augmented reality. I want to be doing virtual reality. I want to be doing cinema 4D and, and 4D rendering and a 360 degree software and stuff. So yeah, I wanted to get into that, you know, uh, and, and that kind of catapulted me into the projects that I'm that I'm at now which are basically working in, uh, like, I, I spent the last, like, year and a half kind of 
retracing my steps mm. into visual arts again. Like I, as a teenager, I used to do like acrylic painting and I used to like put glass in the painting, like broken glass and stuff. So I was actually like taking broken glass pieces and just like cool. putting it onto my acrylic paintings and then it would dry like that. So I liked the texture and stuff that it would create. And I would just spend time like in my backyard, like just, you know, figuring that shit out, you know, and, and I either had a glue gun or, you know, I was like creating texture and stuff with the glass and the paint so this was like something i was like actually like now you know that i've been diagnosed uh, with autism and adhd and i know all the the scope of my sensory processing disorders all of the stuff i've now been able to embrace like my stimming habits i've been able to embrace what makes me soothed and you know not ignore these things anymore because i used you know i mean most uh especially autistic adults would um you know identify with this experience of being having to mask who you are you know you have to mask the rawness the, you have to f put up your own filters because it's either too brash or like some things like you just don't understand social situations mostly like half the time I'm just fucking pretending like, half the time like I I'm just like I don't really get the jokes like I'm trying to you know mediate my way through things and I mean obviously like I'm I'm not like a flat lined person I, I, I understand humor and stuff and you know I, I definitely feel all those things but for the most part socially like I, I had a mask on you know and, and it was unhealthy healthy it also like depletes your resources and like I'd say my um reservoir <laughs> like it, it, it would uh like it would deplete my like extrovert reservoir you know the things that I needed to to exemplify myself and it, it was like I had a lot of difficulties with my body a lot of hard I, I guess things you know to to just deal with you know in in, in my day-to-day -day life so getting back into visual arts was more kind of like an active meditation but I was like actually like, mm. I really want to turn something into this because Montreal had also closed their glass facilities recently in the last like two, three years or something like this. So there's just an exponential amount of glass that's just like sitting in factories right now. Like they, they're they not recycling like glass, like, I, you know, and, and mirrors and all that stuff. Like it's just going to landfill. So I was like, you know what? I, I started collecting broken mirrors and it's also kind of an obsession. Like I'm obsessed with triangles. I'm obsessed with light. I'm obsessed with frequencies. I'm obsessed with glass and mirrors and like broken pieces of things yeah. to like put together as like a mosaic style of stuff but that's also why I really like sound design is because I'm like I'm basically just making like a whole mosaic of frequencies you know you're creating like mm -hmm. a like in the way that I also see synesthetically like I, I create like a mosaic like a portrait of sound like it, it's like I can see the colors and the things that belong together in their placements and where they need to be and things that have to be changed and stuff that's off per se or like you know I have to fix stuff I see it also in colors so I'm like I need it you know I feel that like sound design also really is like capitulated to me as like putting together pieces of like you know wiggly air and frequencies and color so I, I just wanted to like transcend the barriers between sound design and visual arts so I <laughs> have been you know going like nice. to garbages and like dumpsters and stuff it's art <laughs> like <laughs> It's art. <laughs> it's like, I, I get that. Like, <laughs> yo, it I is. I did some of that. It's like also in, when I was in CJ, the dirty I, I audio engineer CGIP going through the garbage. I've <laughs> done similar things, you know. It's real for sure. <laughs> yo, it's real though. Like, I mean, I also dumpster dived for food before, but you know, this was different. Dumpster diving for art, like <laughs> saving things from landfill. They're landfill. They're like two and the same thing. Yeah. So I ended up just going through like the alleyways on my bike. Like I was, I'm the girl who fucking carries like a plastic bag and like bike grease in her bag, you know, just in case like I need to like haul some shit on my bike, right. like on my way home from somewhere. Like I see like a mirror opportunity that I can't pass up, you know, so like I've broken some mirrors that I can't carry myself and put them yeah, in fit, these no plastic bags just to fucking take it home. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't fit. No problem. It's going to be broken anyways. So I like you, you, if you imagine like you have people walking by like in the alleyways and I'm just smashing fucking mirrors. Like they're just like, what the fuck? Like I had one person once. Uh, it was a pretty big mirror, but I needed it. Like it was like I looked at it and I was like, I need this. <laughs> like I need you. And I need this. To, like I need you to come home with me. Like I have, a, you know, like it's like I, 
I feel like, you know, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm talking to like the broken dark soul that's like, you have to come. Oh my God. Like, (laughs) you, you, I have plans for you. Like, (laughs) and so like, I'm just so dumb with all these like stories in my head. But yeah, like, I have like these like connections, I guess, with inanimate objects, like where I'm just like, I have plans for you. You have to come home with me, make this happen. And then I break it in the alleyway and then I put everything in the, the bag and people are like, what the fuck? (laughs) <laughs> who's putting broken glass in this plastic bag just to bike home with it me <laughs> uh because I, I just had this long vision of like i really want to make new art pieces with broken mirrors and this also reflects my reality with autism and being like you know not like i, I have so much light to reflect back out but it's difficult for me to receive that light from other people right. you know also just playing in terms of the isolation experiences that we we deal with and stuff and so i'm basically creating now I'm I'm writing a grant which is really exciting I have like four different grants that I'm writing so you better get ready for this they're very big projects I found a local 3D artist to commission out of this just to add mentorship and collaborator work with because I need to get into that reality of like, you know, software use and design work and stuff. So I wanted to start off with him. And basically this mirror project, I'm getting also into an application for the Eastern Bloc Times Art Vault residency that's available. So I'm I'm applying into this for January and I'm basically, you know, the, the residency is in April and and um, okay, I Okay, right. Right on. I'm turning in, like, I have a collection of 10 pieces that I've drawn out. I'm like, okay, I can use my mirrors to basically recreate these new pieces. Like, I, I'm doing a collection of eyes to start with. Um, and I have two that are kind of, you know, they're about 40, 60% done. But essentially, I want to create sound worlds for them in an augmented reality form. So I'm creating the mirror pieces and the sculpture. Um, so I'm creating the physical sculpture of it. But what I want to do is I want to do a complete render with Fusion 360 and get all those very finite details and specs into the software to digitize it in the mapping. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to augment pieces of those mirrors to come out available through QR codes and stuff. And I'm basically going to be augmenting my mirrors into a digital space. So there's going to be the in-person experience of the mirror itself and the physical, uh, you know, experience of seeing it um, face to face. But then there's going to be the experience of a sa- of, of a complete sound environment and world that is going to come alive when you have, you know, either an iPad, a phone or whatever. And eventually I want to have it available Whoa. on a, on the metaverse. Like I'm planning that's, on buying land that's in huge. the metaverse to, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a whole separate, it, it, this is a really, yeah, it's a really cool grant called the uh, Strategic Art Fund with CAC. And um, I'm asking 25 5k basically to just buy land in the metaverse as Whoa, real estate that's so that i can build so on wow. it and i can have very cool yeah i can have an online digital art <laughs> yeah it is it's fucking amazing i'm like yeah this fucking can work like i'm making this happen and the the artist that i have on board is chopin joseph and uh he's relatively new but he's doing stuff for like le ballet uh de montreal like he's He's really like has a lot of great projects going and he's in deep into NFTs right now. He's doing his own series of stuff. So I'm like, this is really where I want to go. But how do I get my foot in the door as a sound designer and, you know, multidisciplinary artist into visual arts? Well, how do I even start there? Well, I need to tie it into everything else I know how to do, which is sound design and environment creation, point source design and and all of that stuff. And I'm like, well, yeah, I can fucking definitely do that. So I can tie in all of my deep meanings and philosophical reflections into my mirror work by transitioning them to an augmented reality scope and experience. So I'm taking a whole collection. The The first grant that I'm applying for is for all 10, but the residencies that I'm mm. applying for are going to help me realize the, the first two pieces. So basically the Eastern Bloc Art Vault application is going to be basically a headway into the rest of the the collection of mirrors that I'm going to take in over two years to develop and design and put on the metaverse essentially. So I want, I, I'm going to be doing that, you know, and creating the digital scope of creating like a, an environment where you can basically just walk in digitally. It's open internationally to anybody, you know, that they can access the digital version of my mirrors, you know, and I can actually create in Fusion 360 the reflection of a mirror. Like I can actually, yeah, yeah, in Da Vinci. I, 
I yeah, like yeah. you can really create it. So I'm like, I, I, I there's yeah, no yeah. limits, you know. So <laughs> I'm wow. just taking it as far as I can fucking go because I really believe that we're at the forefront here of a giant curve and a wave of technology that's like unprecedented. Yeah. Like I really Kayla, let me firmly this. believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to ask you this because okay, so we've interviewed multiple musicians, audio engineers so far, and you just hit on something that I th I, I even think of and. It, Congrats to you on that! Like kudos. Why the metaverse? And w why? Like I think you're like thinking in the future, and, and I know that's probably the answer. But like, <laughs> where does that come from? Like your foresight is really acute. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, tell me about that, please. <laughs> well, I mean, I innately got interest with NFTs and stuff, and then I was like, well, I I've always been into the the whole blockchain technology from the beginning. Like I was mm -hmm. obsessed with Imogen Heap since I was like 15. Like she is also one of my biggest inspirations for music, especially like Imogen Heap fucking is like my idol in this whole scope of stuff. And basically she is has been at the forefront for like the last 10 years pioneering blockchain technology in the music industry. She developed uh, and it's going to be going in beta soon, which you guys and anybody else listening should definitely check out Mycelia for Music because it's using blockchain technology to basically give artists receipts and a direct payment to any of the work that you create. It's basically taking blockchain and applying it to musicians and artistry. You know, it's like fair trade shit for musicians, you know, because we we right. all and get duped by fees and contracts and things like this. And even if you have a really sick contract, you are waiting ages for the money. Like you're waiting years. Like you you have a multi-platinum album. You don't mm. see that money until it goes through all of the legal processes. You don't wow. see that money until like a year to a year and a half, two years later sometimes. Like you're not rich mm -hmm. just because you hit the single top chart in that week. It has to go through a lot of legal stuff. And so basically blockchain bypasses all of this shit. <laughs> it bypasses the bullshit of being conned or duped or like not paid. Basically, it's a full accountability scope for artists. And it's really great. So I got into that. And I basically, I, I just like started learning about blockchain and stuff and was very like enthused by just the technology in itself. So I've always been kind of thinking five years ahead. And I mean, yeah. you knew I'd say that. That's basically the answer I'm giving you is like, you got, like for me with the way technology yeah, yeah. works and the way our development is, it's at light speed. Right. You know, we're still catching up from stuff that was developed five years ago. Like we're still catching up. Like think about Mac, for example, like we couldn't update to Catalina until, you know, just like native instruments couldn't update to Catalina until they were able to catch up to the new software development. You know, because if you update like to Catalina or you update to like the new softwares yeah, that OSX programs. has, you can't use Ableton Live and all of your stuff. You can't run your programs because it's not matching the language. So everybody's always catching up and it depends on who's at the forefront of that movement, it depends on who catches up. So for me, I'm like, well, I want to not catch up anymore. I want to be at the top here and I want to set the curve. And I've kind of been doing that for a long time. I've been setting the curve and pioneering and trailblazing for like a decade in music, for, you know, networking with all these different projects that I had been on for, you know, the last 10 years. And like, it would just came naturally for me to be like, well, how could I digitize visual arts and create a sound environment for it and create an alternative world? Because I love environment creation. Like, I love being able to sculpt frequencies to be able to create something that people can have emotions through or experience and be able to move differently after hearing it. Like that's what I want people to get out of my sound design or my upcoming projects as well as that they experience it and then they move differently from it afterwards. Whether that's like a more introspective thought, that's like tackling a broader idea that they never thought about before. That's also, you know, coming into the scope of like, well, who are they in the sound piece? Do they even see themselves in it? If they don't, like, did it even cause like some kind of a, a thought or a reflection or even like a negative comment? Like, what is it that can be brought out of the experience? experience. So I thought about the metaverse simply because, you know, I'm like, I see this, like, like, I really see it going there with VR. Like, I really see this going with the headsets and where, you know, in 10 years, it's going to be like a household thing. You know, I really believe that this is just where it's going to go. Like NFTs are just eventually in like 10 years time going to be like a receipt onto everything. You know,
know, like, because it's very hard to corrupt this. It's very hard to get around the technology to, you know, make something bad about what you're doing in it. So I like the uh, transparency that it offers. And I really like the accountability as well. So it's also an investment as well. Like, it's a financial investment in the beginning. So for me, I'm putting, like, a new investment, like, into buying land, basically. Like, there's there's a, like, a, a... thing called sandbox you know i was looking at that for a bit like sandbox is basically you can buy real estate in the digital verse you know and it's like (laughs) it's just crazy that you can think about that because you can essentially become a realtor whatever the fuck you want a designer to an architect a digital architect making all of these renders of different things and experiences and and you know like a museum basically is what i fucking want to have is like a museum of like sound that you can access and basically you can take a sound piece staple that into an nft type of thing because you can be nfts can basically be anything you know and and i can display it in my museum you know i would like to have like a permanent collection of my shit somewhere like (laughs) so i want to have like a permanent collection of my my mirrors like in a hall of mirrors essentially but in the metaverse in a digital verse you know to be able to grow it to the point where i can have traffic and either pay for entry like something like that so people can experience it or people could auction variations of my art off you know like i I want that you know because it's thinking forward of like our difficulties as artists because otherwise us sound designers are really limited towards contracts. We're limited towards short films and through COVID too, especially I was like trapped, you know, in my little bubble. Not that it made a huge difference to be honest, like, cause I'm always in my cave. Right. Like, like not, not that it really did anything to me, but like it changed, it did not change my reality whatsoever. <laughs> but it did make me think out of the box because several contracts were delayed as a result, like for Spark, and for Jessica, they already had the director's cuts made. All of the filming was done. Everything was done and set up. They just needed the sound designers and the final mixing and, and mastering stuff to go through. So I was able to really right. jump into that contract, which is funny because I networked my way into that. How did you get work in short films exactly? Um, one of the guys was a client at uh, the coffee shop I was managing downtown. <laughs> So it oh, just, really? you know, things like that happen. Yeah, really. Like he he came in every day uh, to get coffee and uh, I was working at one of the other locations. It's how I met him. But then eventually he came to the one I was managing and uh, we got into a conversation and I was like, yeah, I'm looking for some sound design contract work, blah, blah, blah. I'm looking to do some short films. And so we ended up talking, showed him my portfolio work, and then they hired me on to, to do those two contracts. And basically after that, I was like, everything is stunted. So I was like, how can I avoid being dependent on a contract as a sound designer and as an audio engineer as all of these you know multidisciplinary titles I can add to my stuff I'm like how can I be independent you know through a lot of this stuff because I I didn't want to be dependent on other studios having work for me or not and then having to invest my time into that to just get paid so I was thinking outside of the box and long term which is where I came up with that where I was like well I'm going to turn this into a giant grant proposal where I'm not only doing my mirror works and stuff like that, I am also doing a little bit of research exploration into digital media design and 360 degree rendering, NFTs and stuff. And then I I basically want to create a hall of mirrors, but in the virtual metaverse. So, I, and then it just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to also trailblaze something for people in our fields to think that it's not just a dead end for them is to getting hired at a studio somewhere. Like you can work maybe have the idea to you know and what I want to accomplish too with East Sunrise Productions eventually is I want to maybe have a team you know that can help transition people in visual arts and have sound designers paired with them so they can either create an NFT out of their physical art how do NFTs play into music in the digital space uh they can make a render they can put it in a you know they can have it we can have a showing in my museum you know we can have a showing in my gallery and we can create more opportunities for artists this way to have you know the ability to say okay well you know what we can we can do this and and we can you know still work together and then it's also involving another currency that's not just immediate but i'd say that it's it's becoming like you know the monetary value of this is like just it's skyrocketing because you have so many people now starting to invest there's a lot of opportunity as well like in, in terms of i'd say this area of being able to make money but it's it's not really just about the money it's just about opportunities how many times do we get you know the chance to expose our 
our art just in the physical world. And most often this is, you know, months in between things. Like we're not obviously exposing. And then with the challenges with restrictions and stuff, like it, it's it's become a thing where I'm like, I want to have a limitless expansion of who I am and also for art. So yeah. if I can also involve other artists and, and say, well, this is what I'm doing and this is what you can do too talk to me and we can work on something and I can maybe mentor you into getting this, you know, a reality for yourself. Or, you know, if there's a sound designer out there, maybe they can team up with some people or, you know, be on my team later to, you know, say, hey, like I have like this client that is an is a pottery artist and like they want to make a whole Instagram of like digital shit from their work. And like a part of the the, you know, the package is that they they have their pottery piece displayed somewhere, but they have a completely different, you know, or more enhanced digital version that can be experienced online. It can be accessed through, you know, other things. So there's so much that we can get into, you know, of like why, you know, I'm going in that direction. Yeah. But, you know, essentially it's that. It's just of, to connect more limitless everyone. opportunities, not just for myself, but for other people. I mean, you're growing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're growing like... Because yeah. that's the thing. I feel like audio and music, it's a digital thing. It's a digital thing. And you can distribute it however you want and connect it to how whoever you want. So I think that mm -hmm. that's like really great that you're investing in that. And like I said, you're the first person on this podcast so far that's discussed that. Um, and I think it's a really, really interesting thing to, to get into. But uh, stepping back from that a little bit, because there's definitely a lot of digital stuff happening in your life. You also had experiences professionally in the, for lack of a better word, workforce. Like we mentioned you being an audiovisual technician. Uh, let's maybe get into all of that. Uh, you worked at PSAV for a little while and you also did the <laughs> rock camp for girls. Let's talk about those two experiences. How were they for you? <laughs> PSAV was funny. I definitely had like, you know, a love-hate relationship with being an AV tech. I mean, it was just its own thing. Mm -hmm. I was doing it because it was like a higher pay. But I mean, it was okay. Like I was, I was kind of doing like the basic rigging and stuff, but I wasn't like necessarily happy there. You know, like I, I wasn't really doing what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. but it was in the kind of environment where I was able to learn. And most of the, the gigs that I was doing was... um for corporate business meetings and stuff, you know, like, and there were some shows that we would set up some concerts, things that I was, but I was not, it, I was more in the background of like, you know, yeah. doing like cabling, like, you know, making sure things are taped to like, you know, making sure things are hooked up to the right points of the mixer, you know, working with all of these cables and stuff and unloading, loading, things like that. So, you know, basic rigging, like I wasn't also, also certified to do all of the other yeah. big shit because you need right. like different okay. levels of certifications to, to have that kind of stuff. Right because it's it's a lot of injury that could happen and you definitely need some specific training. So I, I kind of stayed back as an AV tech, you know, and further aligning like, you know, my work out in the outside of, of like my digital life. What kind of community work were you involved in outside of that? Um, I, I guess I was always like involved in, in projects bigger than myself, I guess. Like aligning with, you know, what I was doing in the trans community, it just made sense that I, I just did more community work like in school. So just because, you know, my trans projects were kind of like, I, I had stalled my gigs and the acceptance of my gigs after mm -hmm. I got accepted. Like just, you know, I was taking the ones that I really wanted to, to do so that was like tribal gathering or um uh what's it called uh there's that festival in switzerland i don't know why i'm forgetting these names <laughs> it's just like <laughs> this is the adhd it's like fuck this like i just you know i can like talk at ends the details about what people like would wear like you know sound and all this abstract shit but then when it comes to like a name like i'm like i feel like a dumb like you know like i, I just feel dumb <laughs> But right, yeah, right. Uh, so I, I I basically just, you know, I stayed like more in the forefront too of community work because it's always been important to me. Like anywhere that I'm at, I can always improve things. I can always make things better. I can always succeed. Yeah. Um, okay. so that's the mindset through any type of adversity I faced is I don't care what it says. This experience that I'm having right now or the difficulty is temporary and it's going to be even more temporary and shorter if I do something. That's a great mindset. It, and see what is in with my power within my power to do. So I created, yeah, I mean, it's a mindset 
mindset that I think, you know, has to prevail. It, it doesn't matter who you are, what's going on in your life, where you come from. Because I even come from a background where my parents, uh, you know, th- we lost everything. Also around the time when I started my DJing career, like we lost everything in that recession. Like my parents would have been homeless on the street if it weren't for my aunt. So they were able to, they had to uproot everything and move to San Diego at that time. So, you know, even for me, like, you know, I, I could have said, I, yeah, I came from like a quote unquote privileged background, but nothing was really paid for for me. I still, you know, was was with this mindset of like, I can fucking do anything. And I know that I can because I see the value in my self-worth. And the who in the I am is, is clear. It became more apparent as I did the deep work, you know, invested in myself more that I really can do anything I want. And then through, you know, developing the, I guess, volunteer work, I'd say, or the work that I was doing for free for, you know, even for Psy Sisters, the networking, the people that I was, you know, making connections with. Talk to us about some of the volunteer work that you did in audio and music. I released a lot of singles. I did a lot of gigs for charity and stuff too. Like I played in a festival in Spain for charity. Like I would donate my fees to, you know, different causes. I did that for tribal gathering. Like I donated my fee of like a thousand dollars to uh, Geo Paradise, which helps like different tribal communities. Like I did that with Keys of Starlight. 80% of those proceeds uh, went to helping indigenous communities. Um, on reservations, especially in Australia, Canada, and the U.S. So Amazing. I just, I, I wow. you know, I didn't collect much money. You know, like most of the stuff right. was really just to invest in in uplifting other people too, because that's where I'm going. You know, and it only made sense that I did it at Concordia because I saw when I came in too that there was an immediate struggle with mm-hmm. professors. There was an immediate struggle with gender identity and students getting recognized and feeling seen. And it's at some point, it's like you kind of have to find a middle ground. You know, I'm I'm all yes. about finding a middle ground and a middle point. It doesn't matter what you believe in. There's always a middle ground to be met somewhere. And you don't have to sacrifice your beliefs to be able to meet somebody halfway. You know, you don't need to give up who you are to be able to meet somebody halfway and listen to them. So I ended up seeing, okay, well, there's a need for rock camp for girls because, you know, Eldad had, you know, told me like, okay, well, they're looking for interns. Usually I send them over there. But I was like, I looked at their situation and I was like, you know, they they don't have a venue. Like the access that they have to band materials and guitars and drums and all of that stuff are very like low income. And I'm like, how can I bridge this and have this kind of be met in the middle because they have needs. And right. Concordia has been, you know, was struggling with gender variations like yeah three girls in like one class of 30 guys you know so it's like (laughs) it's like an obvious (laughs) that was something yeah that i i saw very early on in the program and i was like how is how are we here we need like way more of a diverse student life Mm -hmm. in terms of the people that we talk to we collaborate with in in the classroom and it's a serious issue and I don't know like since graduating if it's been improved upon I know it's been voiced a lot and I know that the people have have heard it you know there was a little bit of uh, improvement like we need to do more than just that so I don't know and I mean because this is the thing too is I'm like I also already experienced the I'd say I'd call it social latency (laughs) like I guess that's my Mm autistic I I have some like aspie definitions of things you know that are more like you know I'd say it's like social latency with um activism like i don't want to call myself an activist even though i've always been involved in like world projects you know and like world things in different countries Mm -hmm. whatever it is that i was involved in at the time i don't really support necessarily activism because of the social latency that happens because people have identified first and foremost with the cause and then they've attached themselves onto it so who they are and their identity becomes that instead of them being who they are and accessing saying their resources and their potential through this medium as an opportunity to exemplify that. You know, and I find, you know, most often that like when there's community projects or things that happen, I like nobody shows up. People just drop the off the ball. They like, you know, don't commit the full way. You know, and most of that comes from a lot of social activism, you know, and in all the different types of experiences that I've had with it. I've always mostly been the one that's followed through with the projects. A lot of the time I've been been alone doing them and most of the time too is I just see the trust that people have with the project or with their own tenacity to get it done or to follow through is it's easier to right. just speak on stuff and yeah. be an activist than right. it is to actually act on your activism 
And and that's why activism to me is just the study of like acting. It's like the, there's that ism, you know, the study of something. Like and and when you put activism, like it, it's in in that phrase for me when I, I break the word down is I'm just like, well, it's not really doing anything practical. You're just looking at the situation and you're announcing things and you're active within that issue, but it doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. mean you're getting shit done. And so I find that, you know, over the last decade too, it's, it, I mean, it's always been an issue because people have commitment issues. <laughs> people don't know who they are or they're lost or th- like there, there's so many reasons like therapy or deal with mental health issues or whatever it is. But there, there's always been an issue with me finding people to follow through with projects for, with me, you know, so I've always been the one to just kind of take things on and uh, just do it because I see that the needs still need to be met. And um, with that, I would say I just bulldozed through Concordia. <laughs> like I, I just bulldozed through this program with like, this needs to change and I can show you how to do it if you listen to me. And, you know, like I'd say like they, they were like kind of welcoming in the beginning. But then when I went through to, uh, you know, the, the I, I went through mm. the whole process to out the, I mean, no. he who shall not be named. <laughs> I'm just like, should I name him? No. Uh, but you probably know who I'm talking about. I ended up, uh, you know, winning that case. I brought it all the way to the Board of Fine Arts, you know, just to be like, look, I have like 20 testimonials, things that I've compiled and written myself about this professor. And this is the need that we're seeing. And I'm like, I get that, you know, people have X, Y, and Z beliefs, but this is where the middle ground has to be set. And this is where people need to feel heard is when you at least come in halfway. Don't stay in your zone and just expect everybody to come into your zone and play by your rules because it doesn't exist when you have a middle ground. You have to compromise. And I don't think compromises are always a bad thing, which is what I, you know, was doing with Rock Camp for Girls, Um, you know, and I wanted to bring in a representation for the youth. I had worked with the youth for a very long time, not just being a nanny, but one of my first jobs when I was like 16, I was a florist. Like I worked at a floral place doing like flower arrangements. And then I was like working at, with my church organization that was taking in kids who were kicked out of from other daycare programs, you know? So from an early age, like I, I knew how much representation mattered. And this crosses all lines of like, of any gender identity, especially, you know, when you're in a, an element that, you know, it, it's proven that their marketing doesn't go. They don't spend the marketing materials to go towards young women. They're marketing the stuff to middle class men, you know, or like people who have dads who can show them the ropes on audio stuff as a teenager, you know. It was never something that it's like as a woman, you see a lot of these people making it, you know, and it's like you have to ask yourself why. Why don't they make it? At what point do they quit? And at what point do they say this is enough? What happened also? Right. And it's like, well, you can say like there's all always the argument is like, well, you know, there's just not enough women or there's just not enough of this. And I'm like, well, that's not really true because I submitted to the Concordia archives. I was taking the like a, a music history course, you know, at the end of my schooling there. And, and, and that whole paper was submitted into the archives of all of the women that contributed in the STEM fields that helped music technology develop. I have like 20 pages of, of women and histories of them and, and what they dealt with too, you know, and, and of course, if women sure. are experiencing that, well, then of course, non-binary or trans people are experiencing that as well. And of course, you know, other people could find difficulties getting into it because, you know, my, my boyfriend is black. Um, he comes from a family uh, that's, he's a first generation Canadian. They're from Haiti. Um, and he's living a life that could never be imagined by his parents, but it's also, they, it wasn't their generation to support it. You know, in, in black families, traditionally, it's not actually like supported to go and do a music career. <laughs> like it, it's not a thing that you encourage your your kids to do. And that's his perspective to own, you know, but it's just to say like there, there were a lot of issues with representation and then it boils down to family dynamics and then it boils down to culture dynamics too. Because you can't blame one thing or another for the complexity of stuff that adds up to why we're still here. Why don't we have this much representation? So for me to establish Rock Camp for Girls at Concordia meant that there would be a consistent continuity of representation 
limitation there that it's like not like they're putting their energy into the space as well and who knows maybe one of those girls who right. was like in one of my yeah. workshops is going to end up going to Concordia or developing an EA career like you don't know what you plant because it's it's crazy because I, I say that because when I was 15 in high school and in my my English honors class at the time fundraised for like these poets to come in and perform. So they were on tour doing like something called the Electric Whale Revival Tour. It was like a very weird, odd name, but of course I was totally for it. I was like, yeah, I'm here for this. <laughs> like, you know, and, and it was a poetry, uh, basically my first poetry slam. And Derek Brown, when I was 15, that's when I first saw him and he, like I fell in love with his poetry. He's the owner of Right Bloody Pub Publishing. Okay. Tell us about poetry immersing itself in your art creation. Um, so I... I ended up now, at like 15 years later, being influenced by him when I was a teenager and seeing like opportunities of representation. I'm like doing yeah. sound design work for him, you know, videos on the side and stuff. You know, it's like that. that's wild to me that it can connect 15 years later. So you never know who you can influence and like who you can actually invest in, basically. And for me, I saw it not just as an investment for myself or for clout, but like, you know, really that Concordia needed something to come in every single year and be represented. And they didn't have the means. It's like, for me, like you can't blame an oil company for not producing free energy it's not what they do you know like you can't blame an oil company for not investing back into like solar like it, it's just it's stupid to like think that well they're a company doing what they know best why don't you build another company that can compete with that and then eventually the market will change based on the individual's contribution and competition you know in the market and i find like that creates more of a healthy dynamic than just like forced you know applications or most affirmative actions Actions, you know, like I find like you, you lose out on some things because often people get displaced or they get put into a program that might not actually represent them. So there are challenges there that have to be talked about. And I found like the best way to mediate the ground was, you know, with RCFG and, you know, being able to bring it. So they've been able to continue the, the you know, the performances, the internships since I've left. Um, like I know that there were two other girls that ended up having internships and they were life changing internships because it's the first time mm. for some women in the program program to be trusted with the large amount of event organization, you know, audio setup, being able to be trusted to manage all of the microphones, all of the music stuff, all of the drum sets, all of the gear that you need, all of the things that you have to basically go in and, and curtail yourself. So basically, it was just really an amazing project for me to take on, you know, and I was also involved a lot behind the scenes, even when it wasn't my internship, even when it wasn't, you know, I was just there making thing, making sure things were rolling effectively. And it, it's just really a nice thing to reflect on because I know that it did affect a lot of people in a very positive way. And now Concordia has been able to put on their website that they have this going, you know, and they've been able to put some representation there. So I'm hoping that, you know, through the EA applicants and stuff and the people who are applying, they see themselves represented in just that. Even if it's with the youth, they're a non-binary or trans person and they say, okay, well, they've actually done work with RCFG, so they are an inclusive program. So that means right. that it, it takes the edge off of the anxiety to apply because a lot of the people and a lot of women that I've spoken to over the years, it, it's, it's the anxiety of like, you, you have mm -hmm. to question of yourself course. and already prove yourself when it's like, you don't know, you don't even have the tools to prove yeah. yourself yet. You know, you, you have to prove yeah, yourself yeah, yeah. before, you know, other people just get the like, okay to to be accepted or like yeah. to to have you know in their it's what's an it unfair called, program bias. or whatever it's it's just uh it's it's a pretty it's a pretty yeah yeah so i mean rcfg was really successful in that light and i'm very proud that concordia they actually allocated money from their budget i had talked to mark corwin i think like two years ago or something that they had applied for money for rcfg to continue so they they could actually pay people they could actually you know hire the right amount of coordinators to to deal with that you know on their end so that was like a really good give back to an organization that really needed it and they needed the place to perform they needed the accessibility to gear they had private rooms for lessons like it's also wheelchair accessible so for people with disabilities or issues with stairs like they have the ability to take an elevator I mean it seems so small but for me I was like that's a huge problem already if we're going to be inclusive and like act about you know um, having everybody we have to also talk about that you know there are people that can't access their venue at rock camp because it's at a school that you know hasn't been renovated in like 40 years <laughs> so yeah. they don't have elevators 
and they're just, you know, reluctant to stare. So, yeah. yeah so essentially, like, I, I kind of, you know, got into that. And, um, you know, I'd say, like, it, it was just, like, a cool way for me to um, to give back, you know, and uh, have that under my belt. Um, and, and that was, like, one of the awards that I won from this. Uh, it was just, like, a nice a nice application, like, just do, doing community work in your degree and stuff. So yeah, that was the course, Elspeth McConnell Award. Yeah, so, I mean, wow. and, it, and it led me to a lot of things, you know, like, I mean, in terms of representation, you know, and, and, and I'd say that that's the bigger problem is that people, especially women, you know, it, it, it took a lot of really strong women to make it, like, to for Imogen Heap even. Or for, you know, other other women, like, to just, I mean, even trans women. Take Wendy Carlos, for example. It's a famous example of, like, strong yeah. people to make it and make a name for themselves, you know, to, to have the representation be out there. So hopefully my trailblazing ends, you know, some of the anxiety struggles uh, for people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really, really inspirational stuff. I just want to, like, I know <laughs> I know we're in an interview and it's, like, I'm supposed to say <laughs> questions. But, like, I just want to say two words to you. And I honestly want to just say thank you. I think, oh. I don't know if you've been told that. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> what you've done... <laughs> yeah. is such a strong stepping stone in a staircase towards a direction that we all need to look towards and work towards as like a community of people who are in this like in EA or outside of EA you know what I mean just like mm -hmm. in audio and yeah. music and in honestly, general Kayla, you, and you're I appreciate the most that. inspirational like, uh, yeah, person like, just thank you. I've ever met you have done yeah, course, so much course, you yeah. Have, yeah like absolutely oh, thank you uh <laughs> I, some I, you know I, I have, have some like hard days, so it, right it, it definitely makes. Yeah. I like I'm, I have like what I call chest tears. Like sometimes I can't cry on the spot, like or yeah. they just flood mm. out of my eyes. It's one or the other, but like I get chest tears when I can't like cry out of my eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my like uh, other like aspie Yo. definition. <laughs> it's like <laughs> chest tears. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I really I really appreciate L that. You know, like yeah. I, I it's like I can say like you know I I've been recognized by my peers in the traditional sense that I've been like hired for like Nuit Blanche projects. I've been uh, taken on the right bloody yeah. publishing, you know, to make like poetry videos for their new authors. Or, you know, now that led to working with a very well-known poet and I have a whole year contract with her, you know, and, and it's it's just all these associations come to a point where like I have yeah. really bad days sometimes. And especially as an artist, it's like you just are always in this like state of like permanent yeah. reflection sometimes. Like of like, mm -hmm. am I doing enough? Am I even that, worth it? That am imposter I, like, syndrome. Actually good like is the shit that i'm doing bullshit mm -hmm. and then all the kind of work that you have put in yeah it's like mad imposter syndrome and it's just like even with all the stuff that i've done you know it's like sometimes it just like you're in the present moment and you're like looking forward to your future in 10 years and you're like well like this stuff is done well what do i do now and the mind is kind of like busy trying of course to, so how know, do you stay motivated so with like, all I, these I different projects that, that you run and that you like, take on discipline discipline <laughs> and, and and i'm yeah. not kidding by that yeah, that's I something that i learned that. when i was practicing i was practicing qigong and kung fu for a couple of years and in my practice mm -hmm. i realized there's a lot of strength in movement and in pacing your movement and really getting that finite detail of like breathing and stuff and i mean i'd like to say that a lot of my spiritual work or like i guess my relationship with god you know if you want to talk about universe whatever you want to name him you know it's it's all points of that same direction of your spirit and like your mind requires discipline you know in the mind especially it, it's a muscle that that requires training and we often give up after we haven't seen like any results yet you know we we give up mm -hmm. and we think that like our music has to be perfect before we release anything we have to like we have all of these expectations and expectations are the killer of discipline expectation kills anything even remotely close to it and it's like your motivation is fleeting motivation is emotional motivation is a part of the heart being like yes 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 take me there i want to go i want to experience i want to do all of this stuff and like i need to get there right Right now because I'm feeling all of it right now and you're feeling all of what you want to be but people forget that like who you want to be you already are and if you're looking at the, the scope of time which is a construct that we created to basically you know sympathize with our reality because it's it's just time is this like very complex subject that we have a hard time understanding you know like in general
neutral. Like it's just a very like I mean, how how do you even really grasp the concept of time right. outside of a 24 hour period? You know, and and when you're required to look in the long term, that requires the focus, that requires the tenacity, the resilience, because you have to show up when you don't feel like it. You know, when your world is falling apart, what is it that you can do in the day? to keep going. Like if it's just working for an hour on the mix or if it's just writing ideas down and and you know fleshing out some stuff while you're like watching shit garbage TV. And it can literally look like anything just as long as you in your brain you're like I hate doing this right now, but I I need to do it because this is connected to who I am and who you are is the same person, the same brain you're going to be in 10 years from now. So that feeling and and the embodiment of that feeling and your goal is is what takes me there through like the difficult moments when motivation isn't there. Motivation doesn't meet me every day. Motivation is not, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's like the most like it ghosts me like motivation ghosts me right. all the time like and, and I'm just like why you know it's like a very bad like you know I always swipe right you know or whatever swipe left like yeah. on motivation but it's like it, it, it shows me up or it's like the asshole from tinder like you know it's like <laughs> motivation is that like douchebag you know like where it's like you give it the chance and it meets you for a day but then it goes to the next week and then it's like well what falls into play and discipline requires the individual effort right what sports do you do to help your motivation i mean it could take it like as an easy example like running for me i was never a runner i was always like super like heavy set i played softball for 12 years as a catcher you know or a shortstop but mostly catcher so i never liked to run i wasn't fast but then you know like about two years ago i was like well i'm gonna start walking home from work every day because it's a walking is like a very like i'd say like um it's 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 not a praised form of cardio it's very underrated and undervalued but i started that way so i started with making goals for myself that i could meet every day right. because Short then goals. your brain automatically It, 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 when obtainable. you're disciplined yeah. and hard on yourself, yeah, obtainable goals, you know. So, I, yeah, and 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 even in my grant work, and even when I'm like having hard days now, I'm like, well, what can I do in the day right now to still meet a goal of like 15 minutes of working on something? It's like this one percent rule. Just put in one percent when you absolutely can't. And when I'm running, you know, when yeah. my brain's like, I fucking hate this, fucking hate this, fuck, fuck, you know, and it's like cursing, like the whole time I'm out there, but I'm like, I'm sweating and I'm pushing my myself and I'm like shut the fuck up my body needs this and I'm gonna feel better afterwards and I always do you know even if I'm fighting myself through it but it's like your brain if you stop your brain doesn't have the chance to expand because you expand right. through the moments of that one percent right that that little point of growth whether it's in your professional work sound design stuff anything you don't even remotely understand you can still develop a whole mastery of that of of that practice if you just do that one percent push for your mind to say, okay, I'm going to commit even just to this day. You know, even sometimes I kick my ass and I'm so late and I procrastinate up until 9 fucking PM to do a workout or like, you know, to fucking send an email, you know, like it's, it's like, I struggle with that ADHD stuff every day. And I'm like, sometimes I procrastinate up until fucking midnight, you know, but I still do it. And I'm like, I still kick my ass. And I'm like, you get this little moment to procrastinate brain, but I'm going to fucking do it. And you know, I'm going to do it. And every single time you choose that it's easier afterwards, you know, and, and it becomes easier to make those decisions because you, you see the long-term results. You see that things are possible. You know, if like I just gave up on my mirror collection and like the other projects that I'm working on right now in the networking and stuff, like I, I'm actually connecting into McGill University at their Kermit yeah. Lab, which is the Center for Interdisciplinary Music Media Technology. Mm-hmm. So what's the project that you're going to do at McGill exactly? I'm actually, you know, trying to get my next, my my other project that I'm applying for grants for to be researched there. You know, and I'm working now with people who are doing their PhDs. This is like PhD level work, but I'm I'm putting myself where I need to grow. And obviously I'm scared shitless. Right. You know, I'm like, I'm fucking terrified of these people. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know shit like compared, you know, but that's the thing. That's the expectation that would drop the dream is like if, 
I sit there and I'm like, I cannot like, you know, actually like measure up to them. Of course not. I'm just starting like, but I'm putting myself there so my brain can grow because every single time it's going to tell me it wants to quit because it's not smart enough. I'm going to continue to do it. And then the next week as that muscle kind of develops, it gets easier to bring on more weight to the research or the information or whatever project you're doing. So, I mean, it's a long ended answer for that, but essentially that's where it all starts for me. And it's where it all ends is, is discipline and, and being kind to yourself too. Like I'd say, you know, I have a lot of self care routines and a lot of like, yeah. you know, I definitely ask for critical feedback for pretty much everything that I do because the critical feedback and showing people unfinished works helps me. You know, it's like our tutorials, you know, in um, East 305 or something like it's like those tutorials actually meant more to me than the lectures because I was able to get critical feedback to develop my work in a way where my brain was like it needs to stop here but then giving it that extra percentage to grow it you know it eventually evolved so you know I, I definitely say that if you're not motivated with stuff too that's also an option is just show your work to somebody like put it put it somewhere so you can get feedback or a result of something so you can trick your mind that you've met your end goal already it's almost like a trick like a mind play where it's like you can show your work for somebody so it's like you're submitting it but it's like you're getting all this critical yeah, right. feedback and then your brain is like yeah. anxiety or something like I have so mm. much work to do now I have all this motivation to work on it you know so it's like you kind of have to play with your difficulties you know and, and kind of trick your mind like you, you know and that comes with knowing yourself a little bit as an artist or just you know trusting your your developmental abilities um in some way but that's kind of how i roll like you know it's also kind of like there's a lot of risk for that there's a lot of high rollers risk with this kind of stuff and investing in yourself as an artist and it's not it's not you know a condemnable experience like our, our artist experiences and stuff are often imaged as like we're like the deadbeats who like dropped out of school which i fucking am <laughs> I fucking dropped out like three times. Right. You know, so I'm like, I definitely live the stereotype. <laughs> but there's a huge but there you know but it led me there you know but I'm like we we don't get you know appreciated for where we end up you know we only get looked at for the struggle and like all of that stuff right. which is the emotional inspiration and whatever that motivates people initially but you know what I have to say too in involving yourself as an artist and just being motivated to all do all of these things it's like it, it just it comes down to passion should be the fuel not the objective and most people think motivation and passion is the objective to why they do things but it's not what makes you wake up every morning the big why is actually much deeper than that passion is just the fire it's just the light that kind of shows you the way a little bit it, it helps you guide you through difficult moments but sometimes passion also isn't there you're kind of like i mean i, I get that like you know I, I have hyper fixations with autism like i'm fucking obsessed with something for a year and then it like falls off the face of the earth like it never existed right. you know so some projects I, I really have to fight tooth and nail to be like you're yeah. finishing this you're finishing this you are finishing this Actually, like and you know i know that you're pretty like open hardcore about this uh, so like, i just want to talk about it i want to talk about how being <laughs> yeah. on the spectrum has shaped your work like what habits or approaches take part in your artistic processes as a neurodivergent person that you now realize differ from a neurotypical artist definitely i'd say like my use of complexity and when i say complexity this this means like taking and finding literally whatever i can to make something out of it you know and a lot of artists especially in the sound design world they're like you know and now with sample packs and like all of this shit like you're able to buy packs of sounds right. you can download like people typing on a keyboard instead of doing it yourself you know and there's like that whole fight of like you know if you're going to produce your stuff everything needs to be auto generated and whatever but it's like you know the same th parallel that I have with my mirror collections and hyper fixations and obsessions with that like not right. many normal people would go yeah. through the garbage to just break glass like <laughs> Not many people would just go through that to just shatter stuff, you know, and then have the vision of what it can be greater than that. Not everybody has the, you know, will to want to fucking wash every broken piece or take a whole sound bank of stuff and then use that for an entirely new project. Meaning like I could, I, I even in my music, and that was all often a fight with like live sets and performances and shit. And like, how much sound did you make on your yeah. own? Like, is it just, is it just the baseline? Yeah. Or like, did you like, you know, is it a sample pack? Is that atmosphere like, like a VST or like did you use analog and it's like it always has to be like the certain way and it's like uh. so for me I'm like well I <laughs> <With> definitely <laughs> the voice 
<laughs> oh my fucking god <laughs> oh my god yeah it's like <laughs> oh my god that's like eight people out there <laughs> <laughs> like eight of us oh like god. it just has to be this way like <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it's it, it's definitely yeah, like, it absolutely. Definitely that way, I definitely get that. Like, <laughs> like when I use samples, no, I know I'm you like, mean. Oh, like, <laughs> are people gonna think this? Like, are people gonna think that? That I'm using a, a yeah. Like, where's the line? Yeah, there, there's a lot of like you you doubt yourself because it's you're like, well, I didn't. It, yeah, know, like I didn't create this, but I'm actually ways. you are still creating it because you're manipulating it. it. It wasn't what. You, yeah. So there's a lot of like things like that that I dealt with in music, especially being like dealing with these pretentious fucking people who are like, well, you can just like it's just like it has to be this way, and you're not a real artist. And I'm like, well, what the That's fuck? That's true. I'm not doing art That's for true. you, so I don't care. Like, <laughs> I'm not like. Like, I'm not doing this for you. Like, and this is the thing is people attach onto doing things for other people also. So it's right. like, I find like a lot of what my reality is in, is is in is even with the music that I released, it was different than the other progressive trance that I was DJing. Like the music that I was producing was far different, more complex. And, you know, there were really only just one or two labels that represented that complexity. And I mean, like I'm talking about a lot of sounds condensed into like one moment or a frame of like, you know, 10 seconds or something like that. And, and, and I think too, that's what pulled through and shined through my application to get my fucking acceptance <laughs> into EA, you know, was, was like my obsession with mm -hmm. like complex yeah. sounds and squashing things like together you know and I find like just things that I, I, I really like to get into you know a lot of like quote unquote normal people or like neurotypical people I'd say they, they're they not like looking at or peering into so a lot of the autistic reality is is actually being sought after right now you know I, I'm actually working with a recruitment agency that like helps autistic people find work so I'm like actually asking like for them to, maybe I can get hired at like Ubisoft or like you know in EA games I know that that like Square Enix has a lot of offices here. So I'm like, I'm, I'm networking my way to get into some kind of a part-time okay. job situation where I'm making and producing sound for gaming. I mean, it, it's it's what our degree also allows us to do with the point source audio and working in multi-channel is like, it's, it, you need that. You know, you absolutely need this to create the the sound spectrum that is in games. So it's yep. like, I, I'm looking at that as an option for me to do on the side, yeah. just to have income as I'm growing my other projects and working on my grant projects. But, you know, like I, I'd say like, it's definitely like a, the way that we do things, you know, I'd say it's also the, the way that I'm like, I also so struggle with things comes out in my my works you know like my struggle with polarity and like my struggles with just like understanding the world around me like most of my quests have been around trying to understand the world so it's like most of my creations and most of my art is just me trying to understand and me trying to put a push for like my brain to have some kind of reality or consensus around like what I'm doing you know and, and finding my place in the world because most often our struggle as autistic people neurodivergent people we have that hard time with with social connection but most people think that that's a, a stupid surface thing but i'm like actually the whole essence of human nature is about connection like the whole primary asset of us like if we go beyond like cavemen survivalist instincts like the whole primary focus of getting even innovating right. and, and all innovation comes from the connection comes from wanting to yeah. improve something comes from empathizing with the struggle it comes from sympathizing with another person's experience enough to build something so that it doesn't happen again this is why innovation has skyrocketed you know especially over the last like 100 200 years but even since you know the renaissance times and and these ages uh, in the middle after the middle ages like you have all of this art innovation and stuff and a lot of this comes out of a purge to understand the world or to reflect out a bigger meaning to connect so I find like, you know, the, the neurodivergent experience, you know, is, is paralleled to that. Like we feel and it's often misconstrued that like we don't feel things like we don't have emotions but it's the opposite it's just that you know you can identify or a, neuro a neurotypical person can say okay this right. is anger this is what good means to me this is what happy is 
I can't do that. That's a lexithmia. It's like I have all of the emotions of anger. Then I'm feeling like the happiness from yesterday. And I'm feeling like the quote unquote like misery or I'm feeling like this thing that really sparked frustration. And usually it's through frustration that I have like an overload with something. And a lot of that is because I'm dealing with too many complex emotions and I don't have enough processing time or I'm being shut out to communicate it. Because a lot of the times people like don't want those conversations in their life because sometimes they're tough conversations to have if you're like a person who's like very indirect and like not being who they are and they're they're just presenting a different person as who they are because most people that's, that's basically neurotypical reality for me is just everybody is does nobody right. says what they mean to say and I have to figure it all out <laughs> like, and then I, I get mm. blamed or like you know people get mad at me because I'm like saying what needs mm. to be said and I'm talking about the very difficult subject matter or crossing the lines between extremes which is one of my gifts and natural abilities is to see the polarities and extremes but traverse the mediums between those things and find the middle grounds because it's it's my only choice. I have that one zero mind functioning. So for me to participate in reality, I have to embrace complexity. I have to go in deep and understand all of that and break everything down and then say, okay, well, if you're going to refuse my conversation in this, you're also refusing my connection into this because most of the time I relate to people through understanding and I relate to saying, okay, say somebody tells me an experience about, like, say they lost their dad or they lost, like, their pet died. Well, I'd be like, yeah, my pet died too. Like, and I can, like, basically try to interject with their pain with a different type of experience that I could have felt pain. Even though in that moment, all of the emotions and things, you know, are above my head and like this swirly cloud, I won't know that I'm feeling like exhaustion or frustration until like the day after, like, or the pain until the day after sometimes. Like I, I have to work through all of that stuff to get there. So I find like it's m kind of mirrored through a lot of like how I use different art mediums. Like I'm putting oil pastels onto glass, you know, like I I'm like doing things that like normal people wouldn't do. Like with one of my mirrors, I have, you know, modeling clay shaped into an eye. I have like tempered glass coming. Like I've, I've individually glued like pieces of broken tempered glass to create this like crystalline like structure on top of the mirror with a link to it inside of a fucking eye you know that I'm like making modeling clay around to to form the eye and then I'm using a heat gun to melt crayons and oil pastels onto a mirror that's like it's not supposed to be used that way you know like so I'm often using things that are outside of the box I like creating new ideas and even if something is like I mean, it's one of my difficulties with my brain and being hired pretty much anywhere is that it's like once I, I can't know when the job is like officially done, you know, like because there's always things that I'm thinking about. My brain never stops running of like opportunities, options, things that could be done. Like maybe this reality could work. Maybe this thing could work. Maybe this thing could work or like putting in different applications for like you know, tools that aren't usually made like that. Like they're not usually made to be used this way, but I'm using it this way to get what I want out of it or something that I, I linked as being really cool. And it's a lot of it is, is more intuitive and explorative, but that's also the ASD ADHD struggle is that with our brains, we often like hate following rules, not because it's difficult, but statistically it's faster to just do it instead of trying out different mediums of things by a structure. It's actually faster and you learn faster by just doing the thing and going into trial and error and failure than to just go through the motions and follow the one, two, three, four, five rules, you know, of what you need to do and accomplish. Sometimes that's gotten me into trouble, <laughs> you know, with uh, my work and just being in, in professional settings because uh, they're, when you challenge structures, yeah. obviously people are rattled by what they're used to. How has that impacted your professional work? I, I've actually found it more difficult to be in structures that are immovable than it is for me to, you know, just create stuff on a whim and, you know, use whatever I can, essentially. So, yeah, <laughs> I guess, uh, like, I, I'd say, like, too, to, like, touch on that reality, like, you know, it, it's, it's more like it, the work, too, that I'm doing and, and the projects, especially, like, the other grant that I'm using for research and creation at McGill, like, this is going to be, like, I want as many speakers as I could work with as possible just so that I can recreate the autistic experience of what it's like to be in my mind. Like, and it, it took so much level of observation to myself, a lot of therapy, <laughs> a lot of 
understanding who I am in different okay. things, healing through all of this trauma, generational trauma as well. You know, because a lot of the triggers, like I believe that 80% of your life you can control, but there's 20% that you can't. So what do we do with the parts that we can't control? What do we do? You know, we we basically just have to identify our trigger and our, our what's coming up for us. And for me, sometimes a lot of it's involuntary. Like my synesthesia is involuntary. I don't trigger this. You know, I could if I wanted to, but that's when I, I had the idea is like, if I could trigger my synesthesia and interact with it, it's basically like, you know, an ironic play of like, I'm interacting with something that's usually involuntary and I'm creating an experience for people that could paint a bigger picture of what it's like to be in my brain, like during an overload or creating a full sound environment of what it's like on a daily basis for me, you know, or just the, having that, that, that experience, you know, make headway, like, you know, for other people or neurotypical people to, to, to see. And, and especially because I, I know neurotypical people do experience some types of difficulties, you know, they like everybody has like their challenges, you know, and, and it's not to undermine neurotypical experience anyways, you know, because I know that a lot of people have their own functions, their own traumas, things to heal, you know, but there is a, a place of neurobiological discussion that has to be had that it's a brain development and it's working with the synapses in the brain to understand how autism works, which is you're working with the space in between neurons that fire off. It's pretty fucking complex and, and crazy to think about. So a lot of my work and, and future projects in this next year are really around getting that autistic perspective out there so that people can see themselves and experience it as well. Even with the AR mirror stuff that I was talking about, it's just interesting because they'll be experiencing through augmented reality what I experience through sensory processing disorder because that you know motion of like maybe their phone going onto the mirror and then something comes involuntary from the mirror. That's like kind of my reality of like having involuntary things happen to me that you can't Control. They can't control that action that's coming out of the mirror or the pieces falling off or things like this. You know, like it, it's just to show and challenge that 20% that we can't control also. So I'm trying to, you know, very systematically and like trying to weave together all of these deep, complex meanings into the autistic ex experience as well, because, you know, we're often just seen as these like smart people who like do things. And then, you know, I don't know, it's just like the, the dude who's smart at math or something or like the doctor doctor that never trained to be a doctor but like knows how to do surgeries or some shit like it's always this representation in the media so I'm like maybe I can also bridge this into a reality for people to experience and come to know and then hopefully that makes more ripples and waves into how other autistic people can see themselves and what's possible because I'm just trying you know I'm, I'm defying every odd that I can <laughs> basically against myself and the yeah, world yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> like. it's a constant challenge you know it's it's a constant battle and i think that like doing all these different things allows you to just stay active and stay you know like feel alive you know i like just i'm doing stuff i'm experiencing it i'm learning as i go and uh i think it's mm -hmm. just a great way to just be all cylinders on and just feel accomplished as well you know so i i mm -hmm. completely understand what you mean i was going yeah. to ask myself yeah, a question, I have a question or for answer me. like a question i think that's on the sheet so maybe you could go ahead and ask me for sure <laughs> i have a question for me <laughs> i have a question for me go right ahead <laughs> <laughs> no, I Go was going to like talk about like East Sunrise Productions and yeah. just like, you know, where yeah. that's at in my professional sphere because it's difficult that's to manage what these things and perfect. all the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Yes. You're on the, you run my mind. Go for it. <laughs> it's my like habit of interrupting or like you know just like just jumping yeah. like forward you know a couple feet no, um, but, yeah, no, <laughs> tell us about East Sunrise Productions for real that's a yeah because like, that's a big part of, of like, what you do you know your website mm -hmm. I went through it there's so many projects you know we talked about it in the intro so yeah let's definitely get into that side of your life because that's like very fascinating stuff yeah and there's so much more that's going to be put on there this next year it's great I'm very excited to, to be able to nice. put you know in my section that you know is like upcoming or like my featured sections especially like I, I'm really looking forward to update that with the stuff that I'm starting and uh, yeah like I, I basically you know like another feat for autistic and ADHD people is like the professional career scope it's like how the fuck can you actually manage all this stuff well basically 
If you go to my website, like I came to create East Sunrise Productions because East Sunrise has a special name for me. It's like a secret name. Like I can't, like the letter E is always going to remain a okay. secret. Like for me and the people that know me, like in my closest, closest points. But even for them, I don't think they'll remember. <laughs> so I'm just like, it's a very like, it, it, it's like a... It's like my life's purpose in a way. Like, I, I don't know how to explain it, but, you know, it, it's kind of a sacred name for me. So I used this name and I got this name through, I guess, spiritual meditation, I guess, you know, or just like I, knowing what I wanted to do. And and so I'm like, OK, well, I like East Sunrise and I wanted to rebrand Cloud9. So then I was like East Sunrise Productions for all of the stuff, because I was like, how do I brand myself as an artist? How do I do the professional work? So I'm like, I'm just going to brand me like <laughs> it's just me like I'm East Sunrise Productions and this is what I'm developing as a company you know eventually later down the line in terms of this very new innovative work with sound design I can do pretty much anything that I want because I'm like I don't want to live within limitations like I don't want to be ironically put into a box which is it's it, I say irony because my project that I'm I'm going to be doing research at <laughs> McGill like it involves like me projecting okay. myself into a glass box yeah so it's like I, it's like I'm doing I'm literally putting myself into a glass box to break out of a glass box and show people why you can't mm. put people in a, in a box you know so I'm, I'm basically taking like my struggles and I'm turning them into art into a very like you know fashionable sense where I'm like this is what I'm doing but it, it doesn't stop there so I'm like who I am is also involved in projects I love poetry like I have a whole manuscript of poetry that I've been editing and like you know I've been working on like a you know in a workshop like just you know having like a group once a month we get on zoom and we write a poetry piece or we take like a piece of work that we need edited or feedback on and we all give each other really critical feedback so i'm basically doing that mm -hmm. every single month because i'm always putting some kind of a work up for people to talk about and really give me like the critical feedback like the harsh stuff like the deep nitpicky stuff is what is what i really want you know and so i've been taking that like my manuscript and stuff editing it to shreds throwing some stuff out but i'm like how do i involve all of the stuff into a career how do I manage all of these things you know that I'm rotating around uh, you know all the time in my life and I'm like well that's where the production stuff comes in so I'm like if I just brand myself and if I just do what I I'm capable of doing and I show all of my work and whatnot like this is just you know it's it's an unprecedented type of a career where I can just go everywhere that I need to go but have my name be in the productions you know and be credited as that like it's it's basically making that name brand for yourself you know, to keep your name and to make those new networking connections and stuff. So I'm now like, you know, as I said, like I'm doing video editing. Like I, I love DaVinci yeah, software. It's like it's freaking phenomenal. Like just yeah. the free version and what you can do. It's incredible. Yeah. Like it, it's just, it's amazing. I'm like, no wonder it's becoming like the new standard to edit in. Like, and, and I love the audio features too, because for me, what I can do in it is if I'm making a poetry video for somebody, I'm also crafting like a digital poetry book. Like I'm working with an artist we're gonna do like nft like poetry nfts like a digital poetry book because it, it's just not being done and i'm like why the fuck not because poetry and a lot of this stuff is dying in terms of like being able to have gigs to go and speak your poetry and stuff i'm like why are you limited to just getting a publishing contract or something i'm like don't limit yourself there think five ten years ahead this is where i want to be this is where we need to go and you know i'm now partnering and collaborating with an amazing poet she's got thousands and thousands of followers followers on Instagram built herself up as an insta poet but now is changing like her poetry career a little bit and so it's just a really nice intersection with both of our works and I met her through this workshop that I did last year and we've just been working together for like a year developing ideas and projects and a relationship and so under e sunrise productions I'm taking on that kind of work as well as like I'm you know I have kind of like a um, engineer standpoint of like do you want me to just come and make you something or do you want me to also so be the producer like I have different stages and levels of my involvement of like you can hire me to basically put the images and all the stuff you want together as an editor it's like an editor package you know 
and I have basically yeah. this like a set fee is like, you know, lowest is like 150, you know, per piece. Like it's, it's just a tariff, you know, basic tariff. And then I, I have like a, like an editor and producer, which is like, you're bringing me on for a short film or you need my input for certain things or you need the art direction or you need this other stuff because I have experience doing that, but it's not something that everybody needs per project. So I'm like, I just made it another tier of, you know, contractual work or freelancing work saying like, I'm not just an editor, but you can also have a production package. And this is what we can start at as minimum. And I quote, I give quotes for people. Um, and then I also have a package for community work. And then I also have, you know, a package for like more deep, like, you know, uh, recording stuff or, you know, if it, if it requires like a very extreme involvement. But usually that's covered like in the tier of, of editor plus producer like package, you know, of like I, I'm also going to be in charge of like networking some things for you. I'd have to bring on recording artists, things like that. I take care of everything that's like very abstract for other people to deal with. So I've been able to clarify that on my website and basically just give like a staple of like who I am and what I can do. And basically, like, it took me a while to really understand what I want to undertake with it, which is basically like my professional collections, my personal collections, then my contracts and freelancing work. And, you know, what do I want to have stapled as the Sunrise Productions? And I'm like, well, that's what I'm all doing anyways. So I just decided to make it all one thing and just have a variations of projects and my hands in 10 different things. I mean, but that's that's who I am too. I, I thrive on yeah. that. You know, I thrive on having a multifaceted element of my myself out there. Like it's not for everybody, you know, but it's finding about what you like and who you are and what you're good at. And I'm really good at managing all of that stuff. So it took some training and development and obviously a lot of failure to get here. And especially through getting cut on projects like I actually had last year, a guy steal my work opportunity on a project that I was brought on what? to. Uh, that fake sucks. commercial for a perfume and I was working with this guy. Yeah. And this is why it helped me clarify. Like if you go into my website, I have like my CV that's downloadable, but I also have, you know, yeah. uh, under my fees and stuff, like my freelancing services, like you can request a quote. Basically the way that I have it also helps my autistic brain. I've developed a questionnaire that you will have to go through and answer every question about your project, colors, sounds, textures, things like this. And they're kind of odd questions questions to ask mm. about a project but that's how I see sound and color. So it helps me actually pick footage. It actually helps me edit. It also helps me structure the whole thing. And basically how I got this working relationship with this poet is because she filled out her questionnaire and she, you know, submitted a contract with me. And I basically just took the questionnaire and I nailed exactly what she wanted in one of the first videos, you know, that I had given her as a draft. You know, and that's where I want to be is I want to be able to nail it in as much information as I can get from a person in their project and give them a draft that is exactly what they were looking for, essentially. You know, with obviously room to edit and whatnot, you know, and I did this too with Right Bloody Publishing this year. I had him and the authors as well answer all of the questions in there, go through like what the goal, the where it's going to be marketed to, if they're working with other people, if it's a collaboration, if it's whatever, just to avoid miscommunications or like having projects be dropped at the last minute it because it's happened to me before that people don't trust my working process and I work differently than most sound designers or professional people do and it doesn't mean that my product is less it's actually more efficient and I really believe that in the efficacy of what I do and it's just like most people don't trust that you know they, they, they don't trust either the efficacy of my my routine or the structure and so I've had to lay that out for future clients because I've had that happen before where by week three right. they're like they have an expectation of something to be done but i'm like that's actually the last thing yeah. that i want to do that's not necessarily where i'm at right now with the work you know so it happened that you know i was making a, a commercial for um like a fake commercial you know and it was for like a perfume ad from paris or something and like you know he brought me on to do this project but the opportunity that was involved was I, I was going to be able to get a spot at like you know the mfx studio here it's like it was actually like the whole point was like to go into the you know sound effects studio and yeah. be able to meet in the boardroom and stuff and have an opportunity to show this thing and so what happened was I didn't know that he was working with two other people. He failed or just didn't tell me that it was a team effort. I thought he was just the sole proprietor of this commercial and like, you know, doing this or whatever for 
or um, something in align with his studies, but also like with what he was doing and on the side with career stuff. Because he was super talented, this guy. And I, I really enjoyed the work that he was doing. But like, it, it was like this one dude who had listened or looked at, the, at what I did. Whoa. He said it was shit and he pulled That's... the project on me. Like last minute. That's awful. And I had spent like, you wow. know, about a month. Yeah, it was really lowballed. Like it was fucking awful. Like, and, and it was really like, it, it was like turning a knife in me, you know, where I was like, I was so clear from the beginning, uh, you know, and there's days when I request feedback and meeting times and stuff that I've now been charging and making really strict deadlines that not just I have to follow, yeah, but course. the client has to follow to avoid last minute changes or last minute okay, drop offs. Okay, how do you handle the financial side of East Sunrise Productions? Basically, if I'm at the three quarter mark, you still have to pay me 80%. Even if you don't use the video yeah, and course. even you, if you don't you use did the, the work, work that I'm it's making there. you still have to pay me and it's in the contract. You know, exactly. So instead, I see this guy, like I, he, he pulled the project for me. I had done the entire layout of sound. I did the whole layout of like, you know, and it's just like a 30 second, one minute thing. But I'm like, the opportunity behind that was so big. I was like, I can meet the whole like, you know, staff or the board of these people. And I'm like, that's a really good opportunity for professional stuff and even just networking. So I yeah, lost absolutely. that because some dude that I didn't know was working with the guy I contracted with. And he just dropped the project and completely pulled everything. Thing. And then, like, if you can imagine, like, I found this, like, you know, a couple weeks later, like, I was, like, scrolling through Facebook, and he finally announced this thing after they went and showed it and whatever. It was so bad, the sound. Your, your like, layout. I'm just, like, really? Uh, but not only that, but he so copied the layout that I did and the type, yeah, and the types of stuff. And I was, like, this is so infuriating. I was so no fucking mad no and, like, salty and just pissed. I was, like, I can't believe that this this happened. And, and it's happened like that in a few different scenarios as well over the last two years working with people so then it really like it needs to be said developed the, like the okay this is difficult for me how do i prevent this from happening then i exactly yeah and then yeah. I, i'm mm -hmm. just like that's how i developed my new contract in terms of the questionnaire so when people fill out the questionnaire and submit a project to me they're entering into a pre-contractual agreement so by the time they finish the contract or the the questionnaire when they send this to me and when they submit and email the questionnaire back to me or whatever like like, this is them telling me, okay, I'm committing to the project. I know what I'm doing. You know, if they're not sure about some things, we can talk about that in a first meeting. Yeah. But I, by the first meeting, I expect a deposit of $60 just for the meeting itself. And then we can set up a timeline for payment and, you know, distribution of that type of a fee and stuff. And and basically what I was dealing with most, you know, in the struggle financial yeah. with financial stuff was like declaring a value for your work. Like, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes it's like hourly, but, you know, the questionnaire, like it, sure. it helps me avoid days of work. You know, and meeting times and emails that, you know, like, I'm just like, you know, the meetings that could have been emails and the emails that could have just not even been sent. Yeah. You know, like, I'm just like, I'm trying to right. avoid all of that bullshit. And I'm doing that basically by, and I basically worked and engineered a questionnaire that covers every yeah. single aspect of like abstraction of like colors, themes, things like that. Basically like a first point mood board, a visual board of like what I'm working with. So if I agree, then it's like, you know, we can, we can get into something together. So I avoid a lot of that by just setting my clients up and the people that I'm yeah. working with up for success because I'm setting myself up for success. So mm -hmm. a lot of that comes from how do you set yourself up and believe in the work that you need to be paid for and the work that you also have to earn because it's a lot of hard earned hours, whether we're working to buy the computer software or we're working to pay off our bills, it's all the same, you know, and, and people don't see the $400, you know, microphones and they don't see all these fancy gadgets and the prices that it costs <laughs> you know i think jayan and i were just talking about how we splurged like the black friday sale for isaac yeah yeah, yeah 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 yeah. Uh, this black friday was uh, not kind to the bank account oh yeah but uh, by the way i actually on, on, on another note um I'm doing this year, this year, uh, as people are listening to this, it's 2022. I am doing a uh, plug in fast and we're recording this before 2022. So I'm not buying a single plug in for all of 2022 just because I, Yo. I feel like I have so many and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> I am just 
just gonna learn what I have. Okay, I need a compressor. I already have thirty. Do I really need the newest wig? Right. One? I don't. Think right. So, so, uh, so I what, know. I'm not like anyone can do that with me. So yeah. I'm like, I don't need another granular yeah. synth. I'm like, fuck. Like, <laughs> I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, <laughs> I think like that's SpongeBob. Me, it's the SpongeBob. <laughs> I don't need it. I don't yeah, need it. I, I don't need it. it. I don't oh, need yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's I see myself is. in SpongeBob. I I love SpongeBob. Like one of the greatest me cartoons too. of our time. <laughs> like, yes. For real, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it really is yeah i mean oh yeah but i mean that's yeah like <laughs> buying plugins and stuff is such a like it's a love hate thing like i i don't need yeah. any more sense you know like i have so much that i have to work with but i'm like i do know that for 2020 given <laughs> when i when i get the money for these grants i'm definitely buying some shit <laughs> I, I don't know if I can join that with you because I'm definitely buying some shit. Like, <laughs> but that's more for like professional stuff and not just like casual. Yeah, sure. Like, this looks cool <laughs> and I like how they've marketed the image of like this. Because <laughs> basically, this is sometimes look it's just so that. Good in my plugin folder. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's like that though. I mean, I, yeah. I can't hate that. You know, like I, I mean, they 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 do a good job marketing some of that stuff. Like, yeah. Oh, man, like sometimes the graphics too with like, I love Native Instruments graphics. I really like yeah. some of their plugins and like what they look like. Yeah, I like literally bought two <laughs> of them just because of what they look like. <laughs> like but what, and what they're are some fucking cool. plugins that you like? Like Native well, Instruments? I know I, you're a big Native Instruments person. I know, wait, I know you use Absinthe. I'm pretty sure I saw you in yes. Lab Orchestra using Absinthe. Yes. Yes, I remember this. Absinthe. I love that one. Absinthe, Absinthe. So I love the complete, yes. like I just updated everything to the complete 13 and it's like, I'm just like, I hate saying this, but I'm like a native instrument slut. Like I just, every time they come out with stuff, like I just, I throw myself at it. I'm like, I just throw myself into their technology. And I think it's also because, you know, like I have an Ableton push, but it also started with a lot of the complete softwares and like native instruments, contact stuff. And like, I really like native instruments really got me into a lot of the sound design stuff. It really did. Like, okay, yeah. you know, before you get into the big boys, like Omnisphere and shit that requires require like fucking all your ram juice like a cpu you know it, native instruments offers a fuck ton of stuff and the two that i bought just because they look cool one of them was called Farlight. There's another one that's Ethereal Earth. I really liked the new Reactor 6. And uh, which one? Razor. I used Razor relentlessly, like, through my nice. electronic music productions for, like, bass lines and things like that. But Straylight mm. and Farlight, they had the coolest fucking <laughs> backgrounds. It's like you're walking through Blade Runner or something. You know, like, it's like, it, it just looks like that. It's like a Dune movie, you know? Like, it's like a scene out of Dune. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like... <laughs> I basically splurged on that too and I'm like I don't have the money for this but I'm I'm going to buy it anyways because I really need it and I love granular synth and I also really like the capabilities that I, it it uses for sound design and filmmaking too because most times you know when you're looking at making an atmosphere or something if you can make it with voice the brain is attuned to recognizing voice in like all different types of facets so you're more likely to create emotion when you're using human voice uh, you know if you're using like a, a sample from a core and then you're using that and putting that into, you know, plugging this into a granular scent and creating this crazy fucking atmosphere mm. from it, you're way more likely to yeah. get an emotive response than just like a digital like thing right. from absinthe, you know? So it's like, I find right, like, right. you know, I, I definitely go towards, you know, VSTs and like softwares and stuff that like, mm -hmm. you know, can allow me to not just like <laughs> drool over the image of what it looks like, you know, but looking cool, but also because of the, you know, what it offers. And those two though, they definitely hold fast. Like, I really love them. I bought them earlier this year um, for the update, and uh, I'm obsessed. Like, I'm fucking obsessed with these two softwares. Like, it's just really, they're really great VSTs. But I mean, other than that, like, I often just record shit at random. Like, I, ha I have, you know, a Zoom mic. I have um, an H6, and I often just, like, I've carried it around random places, you know? It's nice. again with the weird That's shit the Kayla EA has in her backpack. Us, like, 
<laughs> the weird shit Kayla like, carries around, like, and just like, oh, that's not cool. <laughs> take out, take out this little mic. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. totally is. <laughs> it's it totally is though i mean it's like i just like all the weird shit that i have in my bag it's like that's one of them it's just like recording relentlessly all sorts of different things and then just like fucking shit up with it like i, I just take it and i throw it into the fire just like i throw myself into the fire i guess you know yeah. just like throw these sounds or these recordings and i'm like what can i do with this like i had a girl um she right. played violin but like really cool violin like the style of violin that she was playing was just different so i wanted to record her and then i made like some odd techno track out of it and it's like it just i, I just took some of these samples that i was creating and then i just like used it for some random shit like it, it's just i don't know my brain just works like that so sometimes it's not even even like a program or a DAW or like, you know, software, it's, it's, uh, would you, know, you often it's, use your field recordings for your tracks? Oh yeah, definitely. I did this. Um, actually, I mean, it, it's for the track magic Island. So that track that I released as a single, this came from a festival that I played at in Norway. Okay. So I was actually invited to play at a midnight sun festival. I played in uh, 2016 that year. I had been already once before doing like basic stage management and networking and stuff. It was a really great opportunity that I had in 2014 that year. So and this festival took place in the Arctic Circle on the island of Veyroy. So you have the Faroe Islands up there. It's like either a five hour boat ride which is what I took the first time. But then the second time I did the badass thing and I took a helicopter. Oh, really? <laughs> oh my God. I took a, hel so cool. <laughs> I took oh, a helicopter man. in. It took me 20 minutes. I was like, I'm not sitting on a boat for five <laughs> hours. You know, I'm, I, I'm here to play. So I'm going to like, you know, be bougie and get flown in. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> so I did. It was so cool. And uh, it was really, it was an even better experience than the, the festival that took place two years prior in 2014 because they had it earlier on in the summer. So the sun kind of went below the surface of the water. Like it went, just dipped below the horizon line. So you had like a two and a half hour sunset. And oh, then it would just, the, the sun would just come back up and it's like one in the morning. You know, so this year that I went, it was magical because I really got to experience the full spectrum of the midnight sun and just see it like dip down and it sits over the fucking ocean like staring at you and the 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 color of the sun changes like you can kind of look at it and like eye gaze you know with it and then it just goes right back up and then around one or you know like in the morning or something around five it, you can't even look at it anymore like the sun is so bright but it didn't move and it didn't change it's just the most amazing thing so wow. i actually made that track specifically because of the field recordings that i got there that's amazing and i was able to like yeah I took a lot of what I was able to record, like some sea eagles, like I got. It was just wild. Like I was able to get some sea eagles, like screeching or whatever they do. I'm doing their like sea eagle thing. That's so cool. Like, and what about some yeah. of your other tracks, like uh, Book of Life or your Key of Starlight album? Keys of Starlight was special. I did some recordings, just random stuff. Like they were more personal recordings. And I did take some recordings from native gatherings and stuff and like story readings like I really love native storytelling and I love the incorporation of the elements and you know working with different concepts of the earth and stuff so I took some tracks one of them was called stopping the world and it was just a story of like you know about mother earth and all of that and I integrated one of those stories into you know the album this way and I was also giving back you know a lot of these proceeds anyways to the you you know, the reservations and the culture and stuff and, and just helping communities reestablish themselves. So I was like, I really wanted to incorporate some of that element into what I was doing. Plus, it was like a very big factor of like my spiritual development over some of those years. So I was just honoring that in a way by taking in some storytelling composition of of just voice stuff and obviously there were just like weird things like a gate creaking in like Czechoslovakia or something <laughs> like you know in Czech yeah. Republic like just like like <laughs> and making like a, a like yeah, yeah like a squiggle or like a you know weird squishy sound with it you know and just working with the oscillation that way and just changing shit you know which I found really really great to do so that was kind of like in the beginning years of when I was like starting to experiment with taking recordings and like storytelling stuff or voice stuff and like taking it to a different level of like how to apply this to an electronic music track yeah. without being a cliche you know and also dishonorable
hole or, you know, just like taking in something that's like super u- overused and like just being monotonous with what's being created because everybody else is doing it. So sound sampling and stuff was always like a nice, unique way for me to carve out my individuality. <laughs> what would you most often find yourself being inspired by, like sound sample wise? Mm, that's a good question. I think just my brain. <laughs> like <laughs> Sometimes it's just really weird. I get like impulses to go record stuff. And then I'm like, sometimes I don't even know why I'm doing it. I just have an impulse to do it. And I guess it's good because, you know, instead of being very impulsive ADHD, like spending a thousand dollars and like driving myself deeper into financial debt or something like that, I'm like, you know, managing my impulses to go record weird shit. Right. Like even if it just sits into my sound bank and I cut it and, you know. (laughs) It's hard, though. I mean, yeah. I can convince myself in like so many different ways of why I need things, you know, so it's, <laughs> it's definitely hard, um, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I'd say like sound sample wise. I don't know. Like I had some friends who were like creating samples for stuff. I always loved like supporting artists who were doing that. Like there was a record label. I'm trying to remember the name. Enigmatic Records. There we go finally like sometimes it just comes to me yeah. um but this record label they were really well known and they were kind of they were the first ones to kind of start publishing a usb basically that you could buy from them and they'll ship out to you in like a nice little box okay you know and so i was like oh yeah i definitely want to get that because it's like a whole realm of artists who were doing soundscaping they were doing all different types of recordings i fucking loved all of the work that they were doing and they had some of my favorite artists that were also doing trance music but they were also on that label doing like ambient stuff soundscape stuff and bought that and then it kind of inspired me to do it myself too because I was like actually yeah like I could do this you know and that's kind of where my sound design stuff especially with Keys of Starlight too there's more sound design especially in that than my first exploration with uh, Rising Luminosity as an EP because that was more like my push to just get stuff out there and you know I'd say like you know my music still holds up till today but you know I'm always like that like evil like that old man inside that's like like the Kevin and Austin and me is like, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. It con- <laughs> like the Kevin Austin and me is like so critical, yeah. you know, and is like it was shit, like <laughs> you know. But that's kind of where I think I found the love and the motivation and the inspiration to like do sound samples was from enig- enigmatic records. That's like, awesome. And, and also like yeah, there was just a lot of other types of you know things that it could find in those times, and um, it was just really nice. So that is really cool. Very cool. And I'm also very curious because you've obviously done very successful things. What has been the hardest lesson that you have learned in your audio career so far? Not to fall in love with your work. That's Mm. been the hardest thing for me, for sure. Like the the number one thing. What do you mean by that? Not falling in love with your work. Meaning like when you have a piece and when you're also working on clients' visions and stuff, like you have to leave some space for their interpretation of your work. Because when you like fall in love with stuff, sometimes you become it rather than it being a product of who you are. Right. You become the piece you're making. And that's for me, it's an ego like absorption, like your ego is just absorbing everything creative instead of it actually coming to, you know, a, a place where you're evolving yourself and growing. Right. And I mean, that's it's OK to if you know exactly who you are, you know exactly what you're doing. You have like 50 years of experience and expertise and respect and, and that definition of yourself in the industry. But at the same time, those people get there because they don't fall in love with their work and they're open to the interpretation and they're open to the experiences of other people, because often, you know, and the hardest thing was, you know, getting shut down by my ideas, not translating either my ideas right. Too yeah. complex. Right. They were too abstract. I had to again refurbish, refine, throw stuff out, reimagine, and that's the hardest thing because the brain wants to be done. The brain is like, I have the idea. It's been finished in my head since you thought of it. Why do I have to do this and put it into reality now? You know. So it's like, mm-hmm. it, for me, the hardest thing was like it, because it's a balance between trusting yourself and then not losing yourself in society. It's also like when you get feedback from people, sometimes it hurts a little bit. You're like, Ouch. yeah. Like yeah, yeah, like you just take not, it personal almost. Yeah, you take it personally, yeah. but sometimes people like you you discern a bit better who's actually there to yeah. harp on you and make it personal. It, it's difficult to take the, uh, criticism. Totally. It's totally. And I think the like, hardest thing of being an artist. Mhm. 100%, 100%. And I mean it, it's just like for me it was like being able to identify 
who I am even in a sea of people and artists and identities. You know, it's like, well, I don't want to be like everybody yeah. else, but I also need people to reflect their experience to me if yeah. what I really want to translate is coming through. That's for me the difficult thing, but it's it's helped me discern and, um, you know, deepen my level of discernment of like who I ask for feedback from, because why am I giving somebody something, you know, and they're just shitting on the project when I'm not trying to be like them? Right. You know, why am I sending my shit or like putting myself into environments where I'm not respected or valued? Yeah. But also, you know, like the people who want you to grow are going to give you the right feedback and 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 courtesy to grow. Like they're going to give you the right steps to proceed to meet your goals. And that's the feedbacks that's usually the harshest and usually yeah. the most critical. And by harsh, I mean they're going to go in on your work. Yeah. You know, and when I go through feedback sessions with clients, especially, and even with, you know, projects that I'm doing, even with my grant proposals, like I have to pitch my ideas a thousand times over to make sure that I'm living, breathing, eating, and, you know, inhaling as much as I can the project so that it's 100% clear for me. Because it's, if it's not 100% clear for me, how can I expect the audience to even get a taste of what I'm trying to expose? So you have to also mentally give yourself that feedback regularly if it's not available to you. You have to remain objective to your work, um, especially in audio, because it's so abstract, the world that we work in. Yeah. Um, you know, I find that sound yes. is the most abstract form of art. It really is. You're literally manipulating wiggly air. <laughs> like... <laughs> 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 like it, you're you're literally manipulating air like you're manipulating frequency that you can't see taste like it, you can't use any other sense except for your nerve endings you know your little ossicles in there you, you can't use anything else but that to determine but the other scope of synesthesia is pretty magical because i actually have my eyes like <laughs> i actually have my eyes to rely on in terms of like a, a 3d space or the way that i hear feel and see things i can actually rely on that to use in my work and stuff but I mean it's not a golden ticket to like the perfect art piece or production it's like you still have to retain all of these other things to like align yourself with your goals but it, it's it's pretty fascinating what objectivity can do for your life and not just that your self growth and it, it's an amazing attribute to have in, in all types of forms but for stuff that's really abstract like the work that we do mm. it's really pivotal to have that objectivity stand because with abstract stuff, it's also harder to relate anyways subjectively to what you're doing. So you, you have to be emotionally invested into what you're doing. So when you're emotionally invested into something that's abstract that makes you connect to it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it translates to your client and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's what they want or what you wanted as an end result to be exposed. Mm -hmm. So that's the hardest thing that I learned because it's always a development and it's always a development of detachment, being invested in who who you are in your work means that you're investing in your vision first and connectivity to your gifts rather than saying this is my identity and I just need it to survive through my work. It's a different mindset to to embody and to practice every single day that you sit down to do something. You know, for me, like I find that that was also the hardest, you know, even now I'm, I'm like making music videos for my boyfriend. Like he's uh, an instrumentalist. He also raps. He does his own productions and stuff and is really like taking off in his rap career. Nice. And um, yeah, it's really amazing. You don't have a lot of producers and rap rappers who do their beats and their lyrics like you often have people who are like outsourcing that work and those abstractions to someone else so I've you know kind of partnered with him a little bit I'm like I want to promote what you're doing so I've taken on like some music videos and stuff that I, I've been making his instrumental album that he's just released and I'm making music videos for that but that's also you know something that I want to do as well is, is um, you know make music videos for beats and things like that but he came back to me you know I, I had showed him and like Two out of the five, he fucking hated. Uh. He was like, this is not what I want. And I hate this effect. I hate this like little circle thing that you put. Like, I don't want that. And I'm like, but I 
but but I need this to like represent the sound there. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, your beats right, are not right, right. also, yeah. you know, like it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like that abstract connection that I'm just like, who, you know, he doesn't understand, but I'm just like, it's also just how I see sound. You know, I'm just like, it might not need to be represented and it might not need to be there to represent the video in its totality, you know? So it's like, I had to like take a lot of shit out and redo a bunch of shit. Even the color grades, you know, that I put on the film, he, did, he was like, I liked them before. Before. I didn't like this. I don't like this grade. I don't like the colors. I'm like, just put it back. And I was like, fuck, it's going to look so basic. But that's what he wants, <laughs> you know? So I'm just like, yeah. I have to be like, okay, accept the basic, you know, look and feel of the, the video. <laughs> and I have to find another creative way to exemplify the sound there or to like, you know, put something on a snare, put something on like a hi hat that comes in every once in a while or like, you know, like you have to get creative with that stuff. But it also comes with being like, oh, fuck, my ego's like suffering now like, my ego's like dead and <laughs> right. it's like right. I'm dead inside and I hate my work and I'm not a good artist because he doesn't like what I wanted to do but I mean you know I have my personal projects and my personal collections to be the director of what I fucking want to do you know and it's like this is how I can kind of separate like it's not just a hobby like it's like this is my life's work you know and, and your life's work could appear as a hobby to some people like my mom thought this was just a hobby for like five six years but I'm like mom this is like my life's fucking work you know and nobody else can see the long-term goal except for you nobody can see that end result except for you and especially if a client is giving work into your hands you have to see the long result with them but you're also in charge of executing it so it's a lot of pressure that you get put on you when you have clients when you're dealing with people who are hiring you to do work for them you're like okay i trust myself and you know the objectivity i can to get through this project but you do have to be a little bit emotionally invested into them because their long-term goal might be very abstract you also might see it as a hobby to them you know like it, it, it's like that that sense of disconnect and the only way you can connect is to the work itself so sometimes it can get messy with like feedback and all of that jazz but yeah. essentially this is the primary mark of how you can evolve and grow and, and deal with your failures because most of us artists especially in designers like we deal with failure on a daily basis even if that failure is a work in progress and an element that we wanted to try it failed you know the effects that I put into this video failed like he hated it like he did not want that in there at all he's like you know like and some people could be even more extreme than that and give you like even a more harsh feedback and say like you you get this amount of chances blah 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 it's a, it's a, it's a lot to put on your plate right, right right let's discuss another project of yours um i'm working on um you know a film it's going to be my first short film as like an executive producer like with oh, okay. um, one of my best friends uh Aliag Malkasian she is an Armenian artist also multidisciplinary but I'd say like she mostly crosses disciplines in the visual art field she does carpentry woodwork she also does ceramics she's making like a lot of recycled art headpieces and things so we've made a film um, an eight and a half minute film that I've been editing and putting together and doing all of the production side with and, it, and it's uh, sometimes difficult to say, I can take a week off to figure this out, you know, because right, right, right. it's like you think you're losing time. But actually, that time gave me a good space and amount of perspective to say, actually, you're right. I kind of want to redo this scene and I'm going to actually place this here instead. And then I'm going to do the sound here. This is what I'm going to try. And then you get to a point where it's like it might take a little bit more time, but the quality that you produce from it is is more profound. And then the efficacy that you develop into making those those decisions earlier on become faster so instead of rushing through stuff just to have it done or to have content produced you're actually learning 10 times faster and then in a year two years three years from now you're blazing through shit you're like okay actually i remember taking that week off and reflecting on this this and this thing or taking that three weeks of space from the project taught me this this and this thing so the next time you see the highlights come in like you're like oh i can foresee this happening and i can and you're getting the signals earlier on that like, okay, this might need to be fixed ahead of time. So you just go in ahead and fix it. And then it, you know, means that the work you've turned an hour's worth of work into 10 minutes, you know, and you yeah. do that by being able to reflect. So it, it, it definitely is, uh, you know, broadens around many areas of your life. But for me, especially in this area, it's very important. So it's the biggest thing. <laughs> Wow. Um, so that's basically all the questions we had. You uh, went in depth on everything. I am just like, 
yeah, I guarantee you this will be the <laughs> longest sound space episode. There's no uh, getting close. Yes. And there's a first for many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, first for many. No, that was great. I was really happy about this. Very happy. A big thank you to you for really yeah. being open about all of your experiences, what you, you've gone through and everything. Uh, when we were like preparing to make this podcast, we were like, you know, someone we should reach out to is Kayla. And uh, I'm just very glad you said yes. It just, I know it, it seems like a, a very easy thing to say yes to, but at the same time, just thank you for being very open and everything that yeah, you've discussed with us today. It's a, I think it's a great lesson that people can walk away with, you know? Oh yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. For thank sure. You. I appreciate the opportunity. I mean, any opportunity I have to reconnect, especially, and then to, you know, become a part of your growing network work is uh, also a key factor in who I am and how I work so it's it's definitely a pleasure you know and yeah. I hope it's uh, not the last time Thank that you. we touch base because definitely, oh, definitely uh, no. oh no, no 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 way we're definitely going to be doing stuff together after you to, hear like, the other projects yeah. that I'm doing yeah yeah like we'll for sure. for <laughs> sure. the other things and the research projects all of this is uh, it's going to it's a really exciting year 2022 and it came out of a very dark period of just trying yes. to rebuild and rebrand and when I say dark you know it's just of a lot course. of you know self-questioning yeah. right? you have to define yourself and then put yourself out there and being vulnerable and stuff so you know and I think like yeah. if you're going to get into any kind of abstract world like ours you just have to be comfortable with putting yourself out there and just committing to that and discovering and exploring because it's basically how I got here today <laughs> through a lot of intense and invasive exploration so I hope that we uh, connect back in like a year when most of my projects and new stuff are yeah, launched your stuff and, are um, yeah really yeah, exciting sure. shit really exciting shit so definitely stay tuned you know I have E Sunrise is my new artist alias on Instagram so it's E dot Sunrise I mean my at is like E Sunrise and it's an underscore at the end everything um, will be linked taken. in the description but uh, before, <laughs> before we, we do, do the <laughs> formal plugging uh, we do have one final question for you yeah so here on Soundspace we have created a little tradition we like to ask our guests one final question so in a few words what is your advice to people who want to get into the space of sound Ooh. Ooh, hmm. Maybe I should just make sounds. <laughs> Have them try to. <laughs> you voices. Just, yeah. Hmm. Just do different Ooh. voices. Yeah. <sighs> Record everything with the Zoom. <laughs> Exactly. I'd say getting into the space of sound, you have to be comfortable with being inside of your head. Because <laughs> it's basically where all of it takes place, right? Mm -hmm. is, uh, sound is abstract, not because we only use one sense to define it. It's because it happens in our brains. You know, a sound event happens and we learn through the vibration and like identifying with that vibration what a sound is. So you have to keep an open box if you're going to stay in a box or be comfortable with some kind of a sound structure because there's many different mediums that we can go into right so if you're choosing your medium keep the lid open and that's going to allow you the vulnerability to explore something very abstract and in my opinion completely limitless like one thing that I could make is never going to sound the same as something else you could make and that's the beauty of I'd say even remixes and things I did a lot of remixes for artists and mm. things like that right. but if you're going to be making a sound piece if you're going to be taking on a project or you even just want to go into engineering the most famous engineers are the ones who create new ways of engineering like the ones who win Grammys and stuff they're the ones who have developed their craft through a lot of trial and error and being inside of their head and being isolated with those sounds. So you have to definitely, if you want to get into the space of sound, just find some kind of structure to start in. It doesn't have to be your end result there, but you can always develop and evolve who you are through just keeping the lid open of that box because it's such an abstract world and mm -hmm. we're blessed with this opportunity right now in this very 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 unprecedented moment of history in technology mm -hmm. we're really living through this and if you're here and you want to try to get into it don't say that it's too late don't say that it's too soon just do it start anywhere whether that's manipulating some shit on a free software I mean there's like a ton of stuff that you can have on your phone just to play around like you know just to take a voice recording and manipulate it like anything that you can do to get your hands on for free if you want to get into that 
go with all the free shit first before you spend a million dollars like with all these things that people think they need to get ahead. You don't need any of that shit. You just need a good brain who's willing to be vulnerable, keeping the lid open of that box and just being disciplined in your practice, you know? So definitely open mind, open box. And I'd say it's not even an open mind. It's like you have to widen your mind. That makes sense. It's not just about being open. You have to widen your peripherals with sound. So, and especially with where we're going with this next generation, a lot of the stuff and the new music that's coming out if you're looking at pop culture all of these things like they're really embracing sound design and especially with VR especially with gaming especially with these things we are entering in a phase yeah. right now of society where we are going to be sought after gaming is sound huge. designers are Exactly. Huge. We're going to be yeah. needed. So, Cute. yeah, start anywhere because the world's going to need you in five to 10 years. It, 100%. You know, and it's, uh, yeah, like I feel like we're like the underdogs of the tech industry. <laughs> <laughs> like out of everything we're gonna that's take out there, over we're, like- we're gonna take over we're coming for you <laughs> one podcast episode at a time anthony all right <laughs> one, ep- one episode at a time eight more, eight, eight, eight more seasons of sound space anthony we're gonna take over the tech industry with this okay anthony get ready to edit out all the ums and silences for the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love okay. it. I love you guys. I love it. <laughs> I'm gonna be there with like a banner and like <laughs> yeah, 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 in the back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I knew them first. I knew them first. <laughs> I will reserve a space for you guys in my metaverse. Don't worry. In the museum. I got to get into that museum. Yeah. I'm going to reserve yeah, a special yeah, yeah, yeah. spot That's, for you. That... <laughs> I, I get Can't one wait. more pixel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh okay. my God. Well, okay. thank you guys so much. This was amazing. Thank, thank you. you. I really, uh, yes. I appreciate everything. And yeah, like uh, just keep me updated with all the stuff you're doing. And uh, thanks for inviting me to your Discord community. And Yes, of course. So exciting, super, super yes. exciting stuff. Yes. yes, very exciting stuff. So all of Kayla's links will be in the description. Please go follow her. Please go check out her website. Everything is there. And uh, go support everything in her journey. Um, is there anything else you wanted to plug, Kayla? Anything before we move on to Anthony and the, the podcast itself for plugging? Or are you good? I mean, no, I, I think I'm good. I, I would say, like, you know, I haven't, okay. you know, I was going to start some profiles on, like, locals.com and, like, different social media platforms but they're not really running yet so all of that stuff will be announced like on my instagram okay. and my website just send it to me afterwards link, uh, and yeah yeah cool yeah. it's okay yeah, cool perfect <laughs> everything will be in the description okay great anthony where can people find you all right you can find me on instagram at akachi.audio that's a-c-a-c-i dot audio you can find me on spotify as akachi and my website is in progress so once it is up it will be in the description perfect uh the podcast is available on all platforms so make sure to go subscribe to us in your favorite podcatcher uh you can follow us all our social media in the description as well and uh, give us a five-star review we would appreciate it as far as myself is concerned giantmusic.com is my website if you need any mixing mastering or audio services in general i am also available for work and it just links to everything i'm at giant music on social media that's gonna be everything so for myself anthony and kayla this has been another episode of sound space bye everyone thanks bye-bye bye <laughs>